thing about when the Big 12 formed and they went divisions and they said the North winner will play the South winner. That just seemed like that made sense because other school, other conferences did the same thing. If a school or a conference now, which I understand what they're doing, is only going to have the two absolute best teams win it because there won't be divisions, pods, whatever they call it, but there won't be like East and West, North and South. It, it, that, it, is Missouri ever going to win this thing? Is Did they before? Not, they were in it once. Right out of the Big 12. Yeah. Uh, is that just keeping the average down even more, that you can't have one of those years where you come out of nowhere to win the – like Texas in 96 won the Big 12 I, title. I beg to differ on one point, and I don't think you were here last week when I, when I talked about this. What I hope that all the leagues do is if they've decentralized the whole thing and not gone divisions, that they have a schedule rotation. So sometimes you can just be in a bad schedule. Like you don't, you match up poorly against your division, but you may not against the other ones. Well, if you rotate the games, then there's a good chance that, you know, you can catch people on a down year and your up year means that much more because even you might be on an up year, but you might be in the SEC West. So, oh, well, bad about in, your luck. In the Big Ten, if you have to play the other division, in that year, or and there has this happened, when you Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State, is a, who's a part of your rotation? Not one or two or three. Three, uh, not one of them or two of them, but all three of them. Yeah. So now, like, so say you're, and I was using the SEC West because let's just use the example of AM. Okay. So the year that Johnny Manziel beat Alabama, uh, AM was still in the SEC West and they still had Alabama and LSU and all those teams in there that they had to, you know, to get over the hump of. Uh, but if they'd have been the SEC East, they'd have wound up in the, in the championship game you know, because it wasn't that good that year. So uh, now if you take those teams out that you don't have to necessarily play all the time and you rotate it, whether it's pods or three, five, five, or whatever you want to call it, scheduling in the SEC, uh, you have maybe to me a better chance of doing it because then you might be able to skip the dynasty uh, in the regular season and just play them in the, in the championship game. Yeah. It, so it's going to come down to it, based on what I've read and I haven't done a lot of study on this guy, college football every day. So the top two ranked teams, the two teams with the best record, but also then if there's ties, it would be the top ranked. Yeah, those are the tiebreakers. If that's the way they want yeah. to do it, again, it's up to the conferences to figure out, like, that's the whole thing, is is the, the power was stripped away of having to do a conference title game a certain way. That was what we are talking about last week. We weren't talking about, you know, all of a sudden conferences can create what they want. No, but the main story is that they are not obligated to have to have divisions to have the conference championship game, and it's this team versus this team, you know, East versus West. And, you know, I, I know your point, I saw people bring up, well, well, now Northwestern never has a shot to win the Big Ten again, or, or, you know, teams like that. But I would argue how many great teams got blocked out that should have played for a title, yeah. but they were second place behind Alabama or LSU that were way better potentially than the team that got the conference title nod because they simply lucked out and were in an easier division. I mean, I haven't heard too many people bring that part of it up. So, yeah, I mean, it might suck for South Carolina or Florida or someone like that along those lines to, oh, well, you know, you can't just depend on winning the East now. But, you know, a lot of teams that were damn good second-place teams in the West that didn't get the opportunity that some team who wasn't as deserving uh, in the East got simply because they were just in a different division. So I think it goes both ways. And the Big 12 – became much stronger in the South than it was originally in the North, even though Texas won the first one. The North was the stronger division, Kansas State, Colorado, Nebraska, among others. And then all of a sudden, of course, yes, uh, Texas and Oklahoma, uh, on occasion a Texas Tech or somebody else got really, really good uh, in the South. All right, when we come back. At college football playoff, but also yesterday evening I received this heads up. Texas is from Garrett Ross who sent this to me. Texas moving towards letting high school student athletes cash in on endorsement deals. According to the executive director of the Texas High School Coaches Association, that's Joe Martin, we will have Lee Wigington, who's now the new head coach at Allen, the largest school in Texas, and he is also the president of the Texas High School Football Coaches Association. Join us today at 345, and we'll bring that up to him. That was from ABC News out of Houston. I think that's KTRK. Is that just a matter of time?
Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, if other states are doing it, you know, look, they, you know, already one player left because of it, and Quinn Ewers, you know, I mean, he didn't go play high school ball in Ohio, but he enrolled early and left. And, you know, not that anybody is going to cry too many tears for from South Lake Carroll. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, nobody's really going to cry too many tears if they lose a guy every now and again because they're such a dynasty. But, you know, other coaches don't want to lose their quarterback or their wide receiver or something to early enrollment if they can invo- uh, avoid it. Or uh, if these guys can make money, they can let them make money. I Are mean, they going to make enough money, though, to compete with those mo- that kind of money they can make with NIL at a, a college or a university? I mean, here's the deal. South Lake Carroll's not the one that would lose a quarterback. Mm-hmm. It's going to be South Lake Carroll taking another quarterback. Yeah. Who, I mean, who's going to out? I mean, first of all, this whole thing, I, I just think is kind of silly. I mean, good for these high school kids if they can make money. But what are we really talking about? We're talking about this is only going to lead to more tampering and more colleges using money to recruit players on an even deeper level. Maybe even in some cases, kind of old school, sending them to the schools of their choice, their high school pipelines. I mean, I don't see how this is that great of an idea. I mean, outside of Papa's, you know, Papa's Burger Shack giving the star wide receiver 100 bucks to do the local TV commercial that 100 people are going to see, I mean, good for them if they can get it. You know, again, we're not anti-money for athletes at all. But, like, this, this to me isn't, oh, wow, this presents open doors and new opportunities for high school athletes like it is for college athletes. This is, to me, just going to lead to – the schools who have money or have backers uh, just basically plucking kids from where they grew up and the communities they're actually from uh, to come play for their super team in high school. Uh, Because there's already certain schools that we see that are just magically picking up incredible transfers in high school. Just magically the mom gets a job at the dynasty school versus, you know, the school that wasn't the dynasty that he was at before, or even the two schools before uh, in some cases. So... uh, I don't know, man. I think this is getting kind of ridiculous. Uh, again, it's not anti-athlete, anti-making money, but what kind of money are we really talking about? Is that going to come from the local business? Why would they spend money for the local high school athlete? I mean, wh- I mean, the car commercial, okay, but I mean, really, in the grand scheme of things, what difference is that making? How many people uh, are really going to be swayed by a high school athlete outside of the 10 to 15 that we're probably talking about? Because... You know, dude on mid, midway wide receivers not making big NIL money from anybody. Nobody on midway probably is unless they're a five-star recruit at some point at quarterback who's got offers from all over the country. And then odds are with something like this that he doesn't even finish his career at midway. He finishes it at Allen or South Lake Carroll or Highland Park or schools like that. So I don't know, man. This is This is kind of getting real weird to me where we're going down to the high school level uh, with this, but hey, if you can make money off your name, image, likeness, I get it. TikTok stars, you know, I, I get the comparisons and all of that. And, and yes, you know, body to body, that's an exact comparison. But we're talking about a sport. We're talking about a team. We're talking about that. That's not the same as an individual TikTok star, you know, making money that way. But I mean, you can't say they don't deserve to. It's their name, image, likeness. But I just see this as more of a this is going to be really dirty recruiting and those types of things versus uh, this is great for the student athlete. And, and, and Connolly has a running back or had one, Trey Weisner, who's hi- highly rated. He's committed to Texas. Everyone wanted him. All of a sudden, he's now at DeSoto, which is a school that's loaded with great talent. A top five program in the state. And, and, and among the best in the country. And now he's at DeSoto. Now, he actually started – his career, high school or late junior high was in Dallas, moved to Mejia, went from Mejia to Connolly, from Connolly now to DeSoto. His mother lost her job. There's a couple of other things involved. There's always that option. But to me, that's the start. And it's not the first time because he could end up back in Waco if, in fact, things don't work out at DeSoto. But it has been going on. But now you wonder if it does magnify. Well, and it does, the more I think about it, sound like they're trying to preempt – you know, getting sued or yeah, I mean, a lawsuit that's... because, again, um, if college athletes can make money, in the eyes of the law, like all this other stuff about, you know, a high school and UIL recruiting, like that's up to the – like the state will be, well, that's up to the UIL to make rules to make sure that, you know, nobody transfers from Midway to, to Allen. But uh, ultimately, you know, again, all those stuff will get challenged. This sounds to me like 
Well, I mean, if these guys can do it, what's the difference if they can do it a couple years earlier? Man, let's get and, NIL and, for elementary and, kids. Yeah. Screw in, it. In the, what, yeah. I mean, in the eyes of the law, and that's now, what they're, they're trying to avoid. It is going to be in the legislature, so I, but it won't be looked at apparently or voted on until possibly January. Our guest at 345, Lee Wigginson, again, he would know how the kind of coach's pulse of this will be. So it, it is just something to bring up. If I wouldn't have brought it up, I'm not doing my job you, with that at all. You know, it's one thing when we talk about college coaches having to re-recruit their rosters, you know, months after signing a guy, which I think is ridiculous. And that's why if it takes collective bargaining, I'm for that. I'm just for whatever, you know, ensures that – uh, the players and schools are on the same page, and there's not all this hopping around. Uh, that's all I want to see. Uh, I hope plenty of guys make millions of dollars, even though we know it's really a select few. But we know there's many that can make tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, and that's great. But, man, we're talking about high school kids now, and, you know, I'm sure that can better a lot of families, better a lot of situations. But, uh, you know, ultimately, we're talking about a very – select group of guys that we're going to be that would be making any type of nil high school money and who are those guys uh you know there might be the soccer player at a school in california who's 17 and has got a bunch of tiktok followers and instagram followers and maybe you know gatorade wants her to do something for a few thousand a year or the local car dealership or whatever like i'm, I'm cool with all that like that's that's all good i don't want to prevent anybody from making money but I just think this has got disaster written all over it, in my opinion, as far as, you know, people hopping from community to community and it not being about, again, going back to, you know, just the, the where you grew up and representing your school. Like, that used to be such a simple thing, but, like, money just takes over everything, I guess. And so, yeah, why not? But I think this is going to lead to the same schools, uh, you know, that benefit in college, uh, being the same schools at the high school level that probably benefit as well. You know, your Allens and your South Lake Carrolls and those types. But, uh I don't know what kind of real money there is out there, and I think the ones that would be making real money would be pretty much the same ones that are making money as high school recruits right now that are getting their NIL deals to sign with Tennessee or A&M or whoever you want to mention there. So, I mean, I'll chew on this. We just learned about this, what, a few hours ago, yesterday, maybe late evening. Uh, but immediately my thought was like, wow, there's, there's going to be – tampering and, and whatnot all over the place in the high school ranks if that's the case and i just think that sucks man because that's not what that's not what it's supposed to be about what but. you say and what we have said and i think even those who want anyone to make whatever money their value is but uh, uh, it does get lost in the shuffle about what it means to be at a school go through the ups and downs and we use this as an example because of baylor by my god had uh, a couple of different ups and downs along the way. And then those guys had 12 and 2, Sugar Bowl, Big 12, and a lot of them getting drafted. You know, it all depends. What value is that to somebody? Maybe not immediately, but possibly down the road. And, and you wonder, and when you say that, yeah, but you know, everyone should have a right to make money. All right, well, it, it's something to at least, and Craig, you pounded on that quite a bit, something to think about. You mean to a tell me of, that if I was doing a midway post game, all of a sudden, you know, there's a scenario, and this is so unlikely, so I understand this. You don't not do something because of the most extreme example. But in theory... Uh, and there's, you know, again, just now really chewing on this. I mean, I, I'd have to pay a kid to do a post-game interview? Well, no. A but, high school yeah, kid? No, I agree. Like, get the F out of here. I'm not doing that. I would refuse to do that. Like, give me a break. I mean, at some point, enough is enough. So, you know what? Make your money from the car dealership or whatever. That's great. But I think this just benefits the same people it's already benefiting and not the majority. And so for that minority, that's great. Again, um, anything, you know, that can help people – uh, just on a personal level, and money is one of those things that can do that. So if it gets somebody out of a bad situation because, again, you know, the, the TV store in town wants to pay them, then great. But I just don't really see what that market is outside of just those high-profile recruits that colleges are chasing, and it's somehow some collective, you know, it just magically appears and, and gets involved with it. I, I just think we're, we're – I mean, what's next? Middle school? I mean, we're, like – I don't, know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just so out of touch with this. I, I'm all for it on the college level, but th this seems a bit ridiculous to all me. All right, well, that's something Lee Wigginson will ask him about at 345. Paul sent me an article yesterday. from The NCAA actually did have people telling them, hey, we may need to look at this a little bit more proactively. So, did you ever see the movie Independence Day, Smokey? Yep. Okay, you know Jeff Goldblum in that movie? I, it yeah. was, he was going around and he was telling everybody, like, hey, uh, there's an alien going to come. Like, he had to go tell the president that aliens are coming. And there were people who were like, ah, there's no aliens coming. And then, like, they show up and they blow up everything and they're going to fight the aliens. That's essentially who Greg Shaheen was for the NCAA. 
He told them all along that, look, here's what's going to happen. The, the, you know, all the way back is 2006 or eight, that here's where these things are headed. And here's where you can get ahead of it. If you just make small incremental changes, then you, maybe you can agree with it. One of them, just an example was he figured they could make $48 million more a year off of the video game that they, that they were, than they were making with EA sports. If they included the players in some of that money, uh, under name, image, and likeness. And they said, well, that's not likeness. And he asked them, why is that not likeness? And their response was because we say it's not. Well, ultimately what the NCAA found out is that their opinion means nothing in the, in legal matters. So, uh, he was telling them all along, this is how it is. And they essentially benched him until he left and put him into other jobs because he was too vocal well, his about name is Greg Shaheen, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to see if we can line him up because we had Nicole Arbach in the 5 o'clock hour. She's now tomorrow. So is President Dr. Livingstone at Baylor. So we'll try to see if he can come on because to me, I'd love to get that insight from not just what I read, what you sent me, but also his thoughts about they, the, the doom and gloom. Uh, or at least, hey, you, you, you better understand this. So we'll see if we can get him on today. I mean, yeah, he was screaming that to them in person. Everybody else was screaming it on the outside, and they were just so arrogant and so power-hungry and greedy, and they're getting every bit that they deserve right now. I don't care what headaches you know are, are created now by NIL. It was long overdue, and it was uh, you know something that should have been a basic right to begin with, and they wanted to play around and keep all the money to themselves, and even with the warning, I mean, the arrogance to say, well, because we say it is. Like, I would love to know who said that. I would love to know who's, who made that comment. Um, but I mean, yeah, that's why they are where they are. That's why we're all predicting their death sooner rather than later. And that's why we're all wondering really what impact do they have in college athletics right now outside of, well, hosting a basketball tournament because they don't seem to have a whole lot of power in regards to, to much of anything else. And I think, uh, it's become very clear how many people are tired of their act. And, uh, now that they've no longer got this great wall built in front of them, uh, where they can basically dictate and determine every single little thing while pocketing everything uh they don't seem that big bad and scary anymore do they no. they, they really don't so you know what uh, that that old guard needed to die out and I'm, i don't mean that literally obviously but that old that old mindset of oh, well because we say so uh that's ridiculous and and they get every bit that they deserve for being that arrogant to begin with even with all of the warnings from him or from you know various others who have been talking about this for several years now all right, some of you on the chat room are discussing this as well, and some of it, you know, I know that you're just putting up scenarios of we going to play the janitor who cleans the stadium to sign an NIL, the football announcer. Hey, you leave us alone. Are yeah. you talking about the PA guy? He probably gets 25 bucks or 50 and, bucks or whatever to do the game. And this is where I get torn on is because I want young players to be able to get money, especially those from, you know, bad situations, especially at the high school level, because you're looking at what, like another four years of college at least, and you're looking at maybe you make the pros, most likely you don't. So, I mean, how many opportunities are there like that? to better yourself, better your family, and better your situations. I do think the whole throwing money to a high school kid is a little bit more dangerous than throwing it to a college kid who's got a lot more supervision. I mean, yeah, we can all think that, oh, well, just take financing classes or whatever, but I know what I was doing in high school. I know where a lot of that NIL money would have gone. It would have gone to BS, and so... You know, that's fine if that's what it ends up being and people live a better life as a result. But I think the fact that a high school coach would, in theory, have to start thinking about re-recruiting his roster, a.k.a., you know, the kids who live there, who just live there, didn't choose it, they just live there, that that seems just absurd. <laughs> that seems absurd. I just thought about what stupid crap I would have wasted my NIL money. Oh, my gosh. Money. And, and that's not why and not to so, do it. I mean, like, no, but, like, I thought about it if it was me, and I thought I was a pretty responsible high school kid. I was a good student. I was in student guard. Like, I was, you know, all that thing, you know, student athlete and all. But if they had started, like, giving me money and, like, hey, spend this on something, it would have been something stupid that well, in no way. Been video games, beer, and pizza, right? Well, here's well, the thing. School, it's too hard to get beer in high school. Yeah, but yeah. Well, uh, maybe where you were from. Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> At least, at least in Pete Catalina's house, it sure yeah. as hell was. But uh, I, I, I know this. It would have been, you know, that stereo system that I, I had to save up money for and pass on the speakers and just get a CD player for my first car would have been ridiculous. And then what's the point yeah. of that thing? And that's one of the things that let's not just say it's for high school kids that don't have yeah. maybe had a handle 
hundred dollars <laughs> NFL week. and what NBA about, players. Yeah. What about people even my age, fifty year olds, forty year olds, people with even degrees? And uh, I have, I mean, I I can tell you right now, I wish I could live my life backwards in many many different ways. Financially, maybe is one of the top two or three reasons I wish I could live my life backwards. Because I mean, I look back at how much I have blown over the years. It makes me sick to my stomach. So it's not just the high school kids and how to handle it, but when will it stop? And I don't know if it ever will. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it ever will because I think you just get lawsuit after lawsuit saying, well, why is this not legal or why would this not be uh, accepted? And so I, I don't know what the argument is. I don't think there is an argument for why you shouldn't be able to do it, but just because you can, should you? You know, and, and so that's where I'm torn because I, I do want to see people better, but at the same time, I mean, we're losing everything that is about the game and – I know some people say, who cares? We want money. We want money. We want money. And it's it all goes back to the money. But, I mean, golly, man, we're really losing a piece of ourselves. I think in some ways we're starting to talk about, you know, NIL contracts for high school players. I think it's one thing if it's like the Miss Florida, you know, women's basketball player of the year. Like, I'm sure, you know, maybe a company out there or even a bigger company, if she's incredibly popular, the number one recruit, you know, that type, the Quinn Ewers type of a player. Uh, I'm sure that they could probably make some nice amount, uh, certainly better than the zero they would make, but I'm not so much talking about that as I am. That's just going to lead to tampering in high schools. And, I mean, is that really what's healthy for younger people? I mean, you could say somebody I know is probably, yeah, it makes, you know, you pay bills now or they've got money for better lunch or, like, whatever the case may be. I, I get that, but, man, I'm torn because I just feel like, it's so much about the money, and it's like now now we're trying to, you know, potentially tamper with the high school experience of just representing where you were born and raised or where you happened to move to because dad or mom got a job, and, and now it's just about the money again. Like, I just – maybe I'm the only one. I just feel like we're losing some of the spirit of it, and it's all just about the money. And I know most things are, but not Texas high school football, man. Well – Not Texas I, high school football. It doesn't mean it will go through. No, I know. And it, and it most likely – uh, that, that, that's going to be interesting and to hear what Lee Wigginton said. And somebody pointed out to me there's kids transferring from Texas schools to, like, Louisiana because they have – and I – like, what, what real money is that, is that creating? And that's what I would love to know, too, just out of my own personal curiosity, uh, aside from what we're even discussing. It's just like, what kind of money is there in a state that does allow NIL for high schoolers right now? What are we talking about exactly? But – I don't know. I looked up like Texas high school transfers. I don't know how many examples there are of that, of guys leaving state for NIL deals or girls leaving state for NIL deals. But I mean, I can see where that would be a problem. I just don't know that, um, you know, it'll curb it all that much. Well, but you mentioned maybe stashing players at certain schools uh, so that when they're done, a, a particular college can then have their way. Markel saying that Trey Wisner at DeSoto will help land John Tay Cook. No, he won't. Trey Wisner, his, I don't even know if he's on campus there yet. He's been working out there. I think there. he's talking about for Texas. Yeah, I know what he's talking about. John T. Cook is a possible University of Texas. Uh, 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 he's a prospect. He's one of the highest rated prospects in the country. But it's not going to be because of Trey Wisner. He's not from DeSoto. He's not entrenched in DeSoto. He's good. He's fantastic. And there's about 25 or 30 others like him at DeSoto, different positions. But I don't think, uh, I'm just going to clarify, I don't think Trey Wisner helps land Cook to UT. UT will help land Cook based on what they offer him, based on who they are as well, no matter the struggles the last 10 or 12 years. But see, that's where the mind goes, and that's what bothers me. It's like, you know, Trey Wisner goes to DeSoto, cool. I mean, you know, I hate that he's had to move around so much during his high school career, but now we're talking about, you know, it used to be, okay, we get Trey Wisner committed, and then when he's on campus or he's on his cell phone or whatever, he helps recruit this guy. But now it's like, it's almost like you could place guys in places, well, to they just did that before with recruit. junior colleges. They did it yeah, before. To, yeah, I know. It was Oklahoma and certain places so, were Texas. So you think that's going to be better for the sport ultimately? Because I don't, and maybe I'm wrong on that, but if that's what we're getting down to now is like a guy being out of school now being able to get that guy, for, I, I don't know. Well, I, just, I don't know if that's going to work at the high school level. Because, right. uh, again, every Alabama can still recruit DeSoto, and so can Clemson and Georgia and Oklahoma and Baylor and, and among other schools a, as well. Um one of the things that uh, this also brought up is that because Daniel, hopefully the Texas legislator will amend the high school transfer rules that make it illegal to transfer for NIL purposes. I don't know if you could ever prove that, yeah. but it's also right now uh, not legal to even transfer for athletic purposes. But Daniel, and you and I know this, you're an Allen fan. I know, I think that's who you love. And of course, we'll have that coach on at 345. It's happening. Uh, I, I talk to coaches all the time and, and there are ways 
Uh, I'm, and there's some sometimes it's shady as hell. But if you get somebody a job within the school district and it's legitimate and the district executive committee, in other words, I think it's the uh, principals of the various schools in that 6, 7, 8, 10 deep district, and they agree to it, it's clear. Well, now, and- sometimes they get blowback. Duncanville got blowback for um, a young man. His dad used to play at Baylor. Uh, Black, he still played. They won the state championship. He was the tournament MVP, even though at times he was cleared. And then the UIL started to look into this, and that still might be one day at well, some point down the road taken away from them. Well, I don't and, know. and look, if if anybody is good at covering their tracks, like I can promise, Craig Smoke an NIL deal that starts eight months officially starts eight months after he enrolls in school. So he didn't move for NIL. And it yeah. just happened eight months later. Yeah, yeah but you can't move. For, you know, you know, you're right. So you're, I mean, you're right. And Texas is pretty damn tough when it comes to monitoring, even though it happens in this city and every city around this state. Players are transferring constantly. I mean, and just think about happen. what about the, the quarterback the, that was at Bosqueville, Midway, and Conley, three schools in four years. Webb. <laughs> and it was always something because his father was in coaching, and so he could go to another school district and at least be some sort of analyst or coach, live in that school district as well by buying something around the corner, and he was cleared to play. Yeah, we do see instances like that happen sometimes, and I'm just, I guess if this were to become a reality, I mean, you could just anticipate Mesquite has some, and I'm just throwing random teams out there. Okay, let's go out to, to Post in West Texas. Post doesn't produce a lot of Division One players, you know, on a, on occasion maybe, but they got this once-in-a-lifetime quarterback and getting ready for his big senior year being – you know, recruited by everybody. And for him, the individual and his family, that'd be great before his senior year. All of a sudden, Allen wants him to transfer for NIL or South Lake Carroll wants him to transfer. Duncanville wants him to transfer for NIL or something like that. But that would suck for the post community. And I know it's like, well, too bad, so sad, screw them. This is his kid's life and good for him and his family. And I get that, but that's where I'm torn on it because I, I do appreciate the community aspect and what it means uh, for a lot of people, uh, and maybe not everybody, maybe some guys need to get out of town. I don't know, but I, I just think that's getting into super silly territory, and I'm not for one second going to get involved in talking about NIL deals for high school athletes in terms of like tracking it like we're tracking these college players. I just have zero interest in doing that. If one of them gets a big NIL deal, I have no problems talking about it, congratulating them for it, and wishing them the best with it. Uh, but that's, that's something I have no interest in discussing as a regular topic. All right, uh, so that's that coming up in just a moment. Lance Leopold will turn Kansas around, at least make it competitive and respectable. I think most of us like what he's done, right? Kind of like what he's done, what he's trying to do. It's not easy. The, they, they have to make up lost ground of a lot of missed scholarships. And, of course, there's a rule now that allows them to do that a little bit quicker. Yeah, there is. Um, but, I mean, it's not a rule that's going to turn things around overnight. Uh, obviously, they're in a very much a rebuilding mode still. And, uh, I think they'll be better this year. I've said this a few times now, uh, but you know, to what extent, I- I'm not real sure. I don't think they're a team that you just uh, snub on your schedule and say, oh, well, that's a win and just move on along like it's Kansas from maybe even a couple years ago uh, where you could basically do that unless you were Texas. Uh, but I do think that you know they are a team that's going to jump up and probably give somebody more of a handful than they realize, and uh, you got to be on your A game. Uh, certainly they should not be a team that you would think turns around and is suddenly flirting with bowl eligibility, uh, but they can, you know, add a couple more wins to what they did last year and then just keep building from there and then hopefully add a couple wins, if not, you know, take even a bigger jump up following that. But it's going to be a long, slow road. I think he can speed up the pace a little bit because of all these new rules, but they also are not beneficial to him. I mean, as much as they are beneficial, they're also not because as soon as you got a guy that's worth assault, uh, some other program's going to come around looking to grab him away. Why, why are you going to say Kansas why would you say there we can give you NIL money and that's what everybody's celebrating right now and that's why I think it kind of sucks but um, you know he is doing a good job and uh, we'll see on them Uh, you know I don't know right now how I feel about you know picking anything more than a couple of wins for them Uh, but you know we'll see how the rest of the summer goes and how that roster eventually settles down I I think one of the weird things that's happened with NIL and the transfer portal is that depending on what level of talent you are at your school you know, so the, the, the level right below you is all of a sudden your triple A when it comes to that. Because Kansas could certainly go and find a guy who might be the best player at, um, 
you know, Stephen F. Austin and say, hey, do you want to play on this level and bring them up? And now Stephen F. Austin is kind of screwed because that was probably one of their better players because this guy can play up. Now, they also benefit because they'll get guys coming down at, at, at SFA. So maybe it bounces out a little bit. But, you know, as you go further up the line, so if you're Kansas, you can probably go to, you know, Stephen F. Austin and Murray State and places like that and get guys who are under recruited or developing now because they were in a different spot. And then if you're somebody like Alabama and Georgia, then, you know, pretty much anybody else is your farm system. Yeah. But you it, can just go anywhere. It's a, it's a circle. I, I saw a stat and it was about women's basketball, but I, I did see this thousand girls, women, young ladies went into the transfer portal. And I think the percentage was like almost identical. The last two years in just over 50% of them, that had actually signed or gone somewhere else, which means if it was a thousand or 1200, I don't remember the exact number that five or 600 have signed five or 600 have nowhere right now. And, and, and uh, that's, that's not going to ever get any better. It's great advice being given then if there's 500 kids who are sitting without a team right now, I mean, what kind of advice is be 500 and that's just women's basketball. Yes. So, you know, forgive me if I start to get worried a little bit about NIL leaking into high school ranks and how that brings out more street agents and more of these speed coaches that aren't on the up and up and so on and so forth, or even high school boosters, which is just a whatever. Um, that's part of the reason why, because clearly right now there's not very much good advice being given for, uh, you know, several hundred out there. And look, maybe some of those weren't even advice. Maybe it's just like, I'm tired of being here. Let's just see what else is out there. But 500 just in women's basketball. I mean, I think that that speaks volumes as to uh, kind of the market right now. And look, if you, you know, these people that are jumping in the transfer portal, you know, kind of like the moment you do that, if you're a big star, great. Yeah. You're going to be Hollywooded up. You're going to be, you know, valeted around the next campus that wants to bring you on. But for the majority, you know, like 487 of them, mm -hmm. I mean, what are they really hoping is going to be accomplished? Because I don't know that the market is there for them. So when you see, you know, 1500 kids in football are in the transfer portal, I can understand it for like, 50 of them but outside of that like the other 800 something i i don't know what what the what the plan is so that's where it, it gets really wacky and uh, a little bit out of control i think is just maybe some of the advice being given and just some of the decisions being made but there's no doubt it benefits you know plenty of people jordan addison uh being right off the top you know of mind and uh we've talked about some of the deals been given in other sports as well but that's that's a lot of players with no home basically or, or no real market for them just sitting there um and for whatever reason why, that's a shame. Juan, we will get back. Uh, let's see, from the 321 on the text line, profit sharing would, would not be a good thing for the Baylors of the world. You cannot generate the revenue that other institutions can get. And, and quite honestly, a place like Baylor isn't going to get as big of an NIL deals as a USC or Ohio State or probably even a Miami when you start looking at the trend of possibly cities paying more uh, more of NIL support opportunities. The bottom line is if you go to school and sign it, uh, a deal you should have to commit to that school for two years that would solve so many problems. Look, if, if it is collectively bargained and you can say, look, look, you're at least here to your sophomore, then yeah, maybe that does slow the transfer report a little bit. But um, again, that's something that we'll all have to be worked out. And Craig and I aren't labor lawyers, so we can't even really yeah, speak I to mean, it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how all that works. I'm not going to pretend to know how, what you know would be devised again. Um, you know, it'd be talking out my rear end to pretend like I know what any contractual language would even look like. But yeah, I mean, that's, you know, in some ways you're right. And, and for those fans of Miami and Ohio State and Texas, then, you know, you can just continue celebrating the fact that you've got the most money and it will be totally unaffected by any of this. But for, you know, 85% of college football, uh, that's why there is the concern over NIL. The schools with the money don't see that or they do and they don't give it, you know what, because it doesn't affect them if, Baylor football doesn't exist anymore or, you know, uh, in, in any number of programs, you know, go under the wayside or go to the side and or go down a level and, and aren't, you know, uh, on the same level as they were at one point in time. I mean, those are all nightmare scenarios, uh, but those are scenarios that, you know, so I think certain schools do have to kick around, not necessarily in the next one to two years, but 10 years down the line. I mean, if it continues on the trajectory that it is, no, there's going to be a lot of schools that can't afford to do that. I think you're underestimating Baylor's money a little bit, but I know 
that it's not the level of Texas and Ohio State, but don't think for a second they can't find some if they need some, and they'd be better off than a TCU, for example. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's that concern. And so if you're all, hey, let's have the NFL of college football where eventually all the haves just remain standing and have their own little thing, whether it's a culmination of the SEC and Big Ten joining together and then plucking everybody else away in some weird scenario or if it stays relatively the same to what it is either way yeah if you're not one of like 15 or 20 programs which is what we've been talking about for like a year now um, and especially with looking at all the new rules that are passed which really benefit them more than anybody um, yeah everything's in your corner and everybody else is figuring out how they can still stay in that corner and that's where the worrisome part comes about when people, ah, oh, you're complaining. No, it's like legitimately like those schools will have, to, I think are going to have to have some worries uh, about how uncertain things are. And maybe it all works out. Uh, maybe it just changes into something different. None of us know. Nobody, no reporter that we can talk to knows. I don't even think any commissioner really knows right now what that's going to look like in, in five or ten years. Yeah, and um, there's a couple things I want to get to you on, on Lake Kiffin, but just to kind of compare Baylor to Miami. Baylor has a lot of money that people don't know about, and part of it is just it's different institutions. Look, Miami is all about, you know, being like, you know, if you if you ever went to a game in the old Orange Bowl when they were really good, you know, they're all about being brash and all that, and they were the bad boys of things. Baylor is just kind of institutional identity of is 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 modest. I mean, the, you know, one of the things I've always thought about is, you know, their fans are much more reserved. Yeah. Than than most other fans. Like they don't they don't go over the edge. You know, they, look, there's the T Rexes and Gold guys of the world that would fit in, in any fan base as, as being kind of nuts. But uh, and I say that in a, in, a, in a loving way. But uh, for the most part, Baylor fans and get knocked uh, because you know they are they are more reserved, and that's kind of just the institutional attitude. You know, look um, to 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 give you an example of one of their donors, McLean Stadium. Dre McLean has his name on the stadium. When he initially made the donation, he said, name it something else. And they're like, what are you talking about? Name it something else. It's your money that got us here. We have to name it after you. Uh, so that's just kind of the, the different thing is where, you know, Miami has a guy like John Reese tweeting about NIL deals. It's just a little different. It's not, I mean, one's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to advocate for one or the other. It's just different. Uh, but back to, to Lane Kiffin for a second. Uh, I wonder how many other coaches will eventually follow suit and say, yeah, might as well be that way. You know, Lane uh, is very good about dealing with the eventualities of things. He's, the, he's kind of the opposite of Dabo Sweeney because Dabo Sweeney will say, well, this stuff isn't going to work, but he's not kind of providing any alternatives. He just doesn't like the way it's going. And... You know, he, he's, a, he's a brilliant football coach and done an excellent job at Clemson, but he is old-fashioned, and he doesn't, he doesn't want to see things change because he's, he's a bit of a control freak, and for better or for worse, and when things you can't control happen to control freaks, then they kind of freak out, but they don't usually provide an alternative solution. Right. So that's what I would say would be different. And that's why, you know, Lane is always going to kind of be that guy who says those things, but I wonder who else comes out and goes, well, we might as well. You know, it's not my favorite thing, but we might as well. Yeah, I mean, I think what Lane Kiffin said was that he's always said the players should get paid, and he still feels the players should get paid. And if you look around, it's a professional sport, and he's just saying, yeah, it's a professional sport, and, and that's a headline, is that, you know, basically just acknowledging what everybody already knows is that college football is a professional sport. Um, he doesn't have any answers, really. I mean, all he was – I mean, nothing different than we've heard from maybe some others that have chimed in. I think the interesting part is him bringing up the fact that, you know, it can mess with team chemistry, uh, that, you know, in the NFL they have – rookie contracts so rookies don't make as much money as veterans make uh and you, you you know you clear the way for any sort of internal issues by at least having some sort of a structure and so I think he feels like if you're a professional sport you should behave like a professional sport and he talks about the rumors that you know guys are making six to eight million dollars without having to do anything and what kind of a problem that can create in a locker room I mean if you're uh, Hendon Hooker at Tennessee right now, and this hotshot kid comes walking in next year. He's apparently making six to eight million dollars already, and you just led them to like you know nine or ten wins in a bowl game. But here's this kid, and he's making millions of dollars, and you're making whatever you are making. Not, probably not that. Do you see how that could create a problem in the locker room? I could see how that could create a problem in the locker room, and so that's kind of what 
one of the areas that he touched on. And uh, I think that you know, maybe the way that that happens is, again, a professional system, which would, again, have to come with the CBA or something along those lines and to ensure that your senior quarterback is not making $4 million less than the kid who just got here from some high school in Arizona or something. I mean, that that is something that I'm sure coaches have thought about. Um uh, to what extent, I don't know, but that was one thing that he brought up that was, uh, you know, interesting to think about. Well, and, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting if you compare it to the NFL. The NFL got kind of fed up with the draft picks getting, you know, Sam Bradford got $50 million before he ever took a snap. Mm-hmm. And good for Sam. He didn't have to work a day for the rest of his life before he even played a snap in the NFL. But if I was, you know, say a guy in my fourth year going into a contract year knowing I wasn't going to get that much because I happened to play my way up from the fourth round, then... I'd be pissed. So the NFL flipped it. You know, they, they have a rookie wage scale, and now we don't really have rookie holdouts anymore. It's all reserved for the veterans and has simplified that process at least a little bit. So it's kind of the same thing there. Although, you know, when it's NIL is not really a salary, it's just some booster making sure some guy got here. So. Which is why he feels there should be a cap. And again, uh, the only way to do that is to do a CBA of some sort. And so, uh, or an agreement, or basically to say that it's professional. So yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things that he pointed out was, you know, you basically got open free agency where a player can leave whenever they want to, to go wherever they want to, to make whatever they want to. And that's all great. But in professional football, you do have some rules. And so that's why I think that he's more in favor of a, of, of a you know, some set of rules. But as he pointed out, uh, he said, why did Bryce Young not go into the portal? If you're advising Bryce Young, why do you not go into the portal and walk into Nick, a- Nick Saban's office and say, hey, I want to be here, but I've got to protect myself, so I'm going to go in the portal, and I want to come back as long as it's matched with what I got here. He would make 10 times what he would have made. How's that not going to happen all the time? It should. It will. And he's right. Bryce Young could have done that. It would have been a super crappy thing to do character-wise, but he could have. He could have walked into Nick Saban's office and said, hey, I know you guys are paying me $1 million plus, but I'm going to go throw my name in the transfer portal, get Tennessee and Auburn and all these other schools to offer me whatever they can offer me, and then I'll come back to you and say, hey, Tennessee offered me $5 million, Auburn offered me six. You want to settle it somewhere in the middle? I mean, what's stopping that right now? Yeah. What's stopping that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so he's actually pointing out, like, yeah, Bryce Young could have gone in the transfer portal and, and like, tripled his money potentially or at least doubled it or, or something along those lines. And so, uh, that, that you know, that's a good point. That's, I've never thought about that type of a scenario, but th- that makes sense. And, and that's why, you know, as, as he said in that uh, piece, uh, he if he could make any changes, it would be a salary cap of some sort. So, you know, we'll see. Well, it took everybody else. Uh, like 40 years to get to a salary cap because nobody wanted it. So it's, it's it's much easier said than done. We'll take a break right here when we come back. After the, the coaching segment we did about who's recruiting well. And, and right now it's kind of an interesting time as you go into the, the summer into the next year. And Garrett, hop on because you're, you're a recruiting guy on this uh, as well. Uh, but there are some interesting uh, teams, national like Texas Tech, Northwestern, uh, you know, even Baylor, who's not normally high up in the recruiting rankings, really kind of rolling through uh, and doing well nationally right now. Now, is that the same come February? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to take some time. Uh, I feel like right now Baylor's in a good position. Uh, Texas Tech, I feel, is, is kind of skewed. When you look at Texas Tech's 2023 class, you have 20 commits. You're obviously first in the Big 12. Uh, you're ranked in the top 10 in the nation as well. I think that's one of those where in a couple of months you're going to look back and the Red Raiders are going to be further down the list. Obviously, your Bamas are going to rise. Uh, even the, Keep an eye on Miami. I, I think that what Mario Cristobal can do down there with NIL can really lead that 2023 class as well. Um, but right now, I, it's hard to really put a lot of stock into what you're looking at when you see these 2023 classes, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you look at uh, the top 10. Notre Dame's number one. They got 13 commits. And then Tech, two, they got 20. I mean, they got seven more than the than the closest one. I mean, the rest of the top 10, 12, 10, 11, 8, uh, 14 for Northwestern. Why is Northwestern in the top 10? Because they've got 14 commits at this point. So there's a lot of weight placed on the number of guys. And then the ones who have lower numbers but are still relatively ranked high, who only have six or seven, well, they, that's the teams that have like the high per player average. So, uh, yeah, you kind of look at both. If a team has a lower amount of commits but they're highly ranked, then they're getting like 
you know, bang for their buck per player. If a team's ranked high and they've got 20 commits, well, 20 is part of the reason why they're ranked so high. So it can be a, a little bit misleading. Um, but, you know, not to deny in any way that uh, Tech's, you know, doing a great job in recruiting and filling up their class. I think the new rules benefit them. We might see them just nudge, nudge a few guys out the door uh, to, you know, add some more scholarships if you're going to have this whole no cap thing uh, to where as long as you stay at 85, uh, well, you know, I think we'll see. And I think Max Olson even wrote an article the other day about how coaches are now finding ways to empty their rosters and basically push players uh, into the transfer portal. So, you know, that's uh, somewhat of an, I think, an unintended consequence. It's great for the coaches who just want to, you know, get over that recruiting bust and replace that guy with somebody who can help them easier. But it's another thing where I don't think the players or those who are, you know, basically looking out for the best interests of players, I don't think they realize that every move being made is not exactly in their favor. And, you know, that, that scholarship, you know, as much as we talk about, you know, I think it kind of sucks that a player could sign somewhere and then a year later be joining another team in the conference. I, I hate that. But at the same time, like, they're going to probably reach a point where you sign that scholarship and that scholarship, even though it never technically was like four-year guaranteed no matter what you're, you know, but close enough to it, that's not going to be as much of a guarantee anymore. Because now the transfer portal and just the new rules of moving around and all that, you're going to see a lot of coaches that take the scholarship cap off that are they're not going to be as patient. You know, they talk about players not having patience. I don't think the coaches are going to be as patient either, at least in some cases. And they're going to say, "Well, this guy's clearly he's going to take too long. Boom, get him out of here. We got to replace him with somebody else." Yeah, well, and, and part of the other thing is is that with the way that coaching. You know, the coaching carousel is spinning so fast right now and you've got coaches that are gonna you know hot places really quickly so let's just use um lincoln riley to usc brent venables to oklahoma and now brent venables wasn't really in the position where he could shove a lot of guys off the roster right away because a lot of them left but lincoln riley was you know he absolutely was and so he can go to usc and be like oh look things are changing uh, you're not a guy we would have recruited. Um, you're best getting the transfer portal, and he can recruit 40 guys if he wants to. You know, he can and he can you know transfer in 25 more and and completely remake the roster in a whole year. And you know the the, the kids didn't. You know that's what I that, know the transfer portal's for. But you could be sitting there thinking, oh sweet, Lincoln Riley's coming here. Well, if Lincoln Riley doesn't like you, then it didn't matter. You know, mm -hmm. if he wouldn't have recruited you in the first place, then if you're, especially if you're in a position of where he doesn't feel they have a strong need, like they're a little bit deep there and they can get by without you, see you later. You know, so things can spin like it all. Yeah, not everything is for them. It's not that. That's why I think that people are saying like, let's let's get some some just overall bumpers on this thing because there's no, it's just a teeter totter this way and that way. It's not balanced. No, it's uh, it's not. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it, it is what it is. Uh, you know, you can't have everything your way. It certainly seemed like that was going to be the case for the players. I mean, most of the decisions being made were all beneficial to them. And yeah, I just don't know that change, 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 without slowing down and kind of like taking a breath after some of these changes is really the best course of action. Because all of a sudden you're going to look up and it's going to be a pile of unintended consequences. As good as maybe those decisions seemed at the time, but when you add them all together, it's a bit combustible. So yeah, I mean, the, the coaches have, you know, everybody talks about these coaches and their, and their contracts, but they also have very, you know, they might have buyouts and that prevents some of maybe, you know, getting fired after one year or maybe even after two years, but there is always that risk that they're on the hot seat as well. So now the, the rosters basically are, and um, you know, that's equal, I guess, I guess we are moving towards equality because the roster spots as on much ice as a, as a coaching spot is, except for the coaching spot does have that, uh, that that buyout aspect to it normally, but Garrett, do you notice when you're talking to recruits now, is like there any difference in the way that guys are talking about how they're choosing their schools and things like that because of NIL? Like, do you see anything that's at least noticeable in that regard? That's what, so. That's a question I've been asking a lot of recruits: is is when you're looking at your schools, how much of an importance or how much role does NIL play in that? Like, are you looking for a school as far as I want to go? All right, for Baylor, for example, right? Like, we know Baylor isn't ever really going to match NIL on the grand scheme with your Bamas and your right. A&Ms and them. But if you do come to Baylor, 
while you don't get that NIL money, you're going to get developed, right? Like, I think Coach Aranda and this staff have proven that they could develop. So it's a matter of balancing that if you're an athlete. Like, do you want to go somewhere and full attention will say, I want to go, I want to be in the NFL, I know I need to work on this, and I'll put the money to the side right now if I get it great. Um, but I think that's really kind of a fine line, and it really depends on the type of player as well. It, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a tricky, slippery slope. But regarding the players I talk to for nine times out of ten, um, it, NIL hasn't been that big of a, a focal point at the moment. Yeah, and I think it's, it's you know, kind of the boogeyman in the media, but as we kind of have to remind ourselves, we're talking about, what, 10 or 15 players that have really gotten some crazy deal that we're aware of? I mean, yeah. it's not like it's everybody on every roster by any means, not even close to that. So, yeah, I'm just curious of, like, how much – because you used to talk to a recruit and be like, I like the uniforms. <laughs> I like the facilities. I like the coach. And now I just wonder how often it's like, I don't care about any of that. Like, how much money am I going to get? You know, let's just cut to the chase. And, and I think for maybe some of the top tier blue chip guys, like it's not that simple, but it is more of a factor than it ever was before. That's that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and. I think that it's going to be one of the things kind of like the transfer portal where a lot of guys hop into the transfer portal and expect 25 calls and then they sit there. Yeah, well, there's, there's some guys that, I mean, just dense decision making uh, to, because you should have known going in that you were not ever going to have 25, you know, Scott. I mean, there's there's guys getting in that, that have no business getting into the transfer portal unless they just had absolutely no other choice. And, um, you know, those aren't probably very recognizable names. You know what I mean? Because... Uh, maybe it was, maybe it was, uh, rare or, or they, maybe they beat the odds and even getting where they were to begin with. And there's some adjustment, you know, there's, I think there's natural adjustment with the transfer portal of guys who were maybe D one that really should have been D two or guys who are D two didn't get noticed, but really should have been D one. I think it's, it's really great for at least balancing that out. But yeah, there are, there are some head scratching decisions from guys that it clearly just seems like they're just getting in there because of like the adrenaline rush immediately and and the hopes that you know a bunch of people are going to be calling but uh, again it, it kind of all goes back to you know that there's that big group of the nil type of guys and then there's that group of, of really good players and then there's a, a whole group that's taking up a lot of space that really have no business being in there quite frankly yeah garrett do you do you get the sense when you talk to recruits as well that they there's less trepidation about their choice because of the transfer portal i mean i think so because Going into the situation now, like you can go and say, I want to go to school X, and, and you go there. And if it doesn't, I think you're more in line to take a risk knowing that if it doesn't work out, you have that option. Whereas in the past, you would have to sit out a year or something. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a, something they could take advantage of. Um, but at the same time, I really think it really depends on personality to personality, family, and, and even kind of going back to the transfer portal. And players going in, I think a lot of that sometimes is outside influences, right? Yes. Like even the recruits now, you deal with handlers, um, you know, private coaches. There's so much information that these guys are getting. And I think a lot of the times, some of the – even the – like say you commit somewhere and, and you flip your commitment because of a friend or something. I think it's a lot of bad information, man. And that's the one benefit of the transfer portal. If you are a player who bought into that – and you get into the situation and realize, oh, man, I'm in over my head. This was a bad move. You have that option. That is a nice option. But it's really just a balancing act. Yeah, that, that's interesting to hear. Because, you know, I, I, we, I only talk to recruits when they've committed somewhere. Right. And we're, we're here or we're at Midway. And they're, you know, it's my guy of the week. And he's getting recruited. So, um, at that point, you know, I, you know, I don't know. So, but, but, like, it's interesting to see the how it is changing and all that but but yeah craig you made a good point earlier about like we're talking about 15 guys with huge deals now there might be 15 more who can go get them after they go in and you know play their way up to it because they're all of a sudden a star but you know the ones who you're talking about are you know i can't I, what's the kid's name the tennessee uh the eight million dollar guy apparently i don't i can't uh, i'm yeah. a liava or whatever yeah. the hell is and he asked me to name the most yeah. difficult name in college yeah. football like uh smith yeah. uh yeah nico i am a liava or however you pronounce his name no disrespect but yeah i mean we, we've it's changed things i mean clearly it's changed things and it's you adjust or you or you adapt or die i mean simple as that but uh adapting doesn't have to be 
you know, just it's all about offering up big money. Uh, I think Dave Aranda's finding a unique way to adapt, and a lot of others are as well. And and the ones that are having to do that and can't just spend big paychecks again, kind of like the players getting NIL deals, we talk about the same 10 to 15 guys, if it's even that much. Uh, but the Jordan Addisons and the Quinn Ewers and those guys. But, like, I don't know, there's like 3,000 other players that are out there that are maybe making like 50 bucks off a local, you know, ad or whatever. So it's not like the nightmare scenario that everybody's made it out to be just because Jordan Addison, Blitnikoff winner, can make, you know, $3 million somewhere. Now, there are levels, like especially in basketball, there's guys making millions before they leave high school. That's a little weird, uh, but I know it's based on potential. So, you know, for, for the haves, it's a, it's a great thing, and then there's a lot of other people that wish they were in that group and maybe don't have as realistic of a view on kind of the way things work, and uh, that's why you see some bad decisions or some bad influences leading guys in the transfer portal thinking it's the best, and it, it's clearly not the maybe the best decision. But, you know, to each their own, a lot of different scenarios and factors in play, but, um, you know, it's it's an interesting balancing act that you're, you have to uh, – to, to toy with if you're coaches and, and players right now. Roger Dodger on the uh, chat room. Uh, all the USC players that Lincoln Riley asked to leave the team were guaranteed their scholarships were told they weren't a football scholarship in, anymore or they can't have the portal. That's, yeah, that's Max good. Olson wrote about yeah. that. It's a little loophole, yeah. yeah. But but even though I, mean, I was using him as an example, I mean, I don't know how many. Like, he could have told three guys that. I don't, I don't know how no, many. No, I think he told a few. Yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, how many did, but I was just using it as an example. If you get a new place, Brian, you know, Brian Kelly had to rebuild a whole roster, you know, because a lot of guys were in the port. A lot of guys, he, he kind of, you know, told them, like, look at this. Door number one is the portal. Door number two is the portal. Door number three is also the portal. It has many doors. Go there. Because that's what he, that's what LSU brought him in to do, was rebuild that team, you know, you know, uh, soup to nuts. I mean, so... You know, he kind of told them, you know, and then he went in the portal and he's gotten like 12 to 15 guys out of there. Well, I, I don't think that having a, I don't have a problem with a situation like that where it's a new coach coming in and he's got to find his guys. But if you're somebody who's been there and you're just saying, all right, well, hit the streets because I want to replace you with this other guy, I kind of have a problem with, especially if it's a player who is really put all of their everything they had into that university mm -hmm. and just because they're not to the same level as the new guy you're looking at they get tossed to the wayside I kind of have more of a problem with that than necessarily a new coach coming in finding the right fits for his system yeah I mean he's got a he's got to be able to run the offense he wants to if you're running a totally different type of offense or something that's not going to fit then you got to do what's best for you because you you're on a a clock. I mean, the moment you take over that job, Brian Kelly's on the clock right now. He might have some security through his contract. He might have a mega buyout, but he bottom line is it doesn't matter about all that. He's got to win and win quickly. And there will only be so much patience for that. So if that means that, hey, the quickest way to winning is to basically get rid of these guys, well, that's what he's got to do. I mean, that's it's his team now. Those are those players he didn't recruit. So again, that for all the the good, there is some downside for players and for coaches in, in this scenario you know it's a uh, not everybody's just an outright winner no matter what so yeah you players can now make money but they can now actually you know get pushed off to the side a little bit quicker perhaps as well and then there's the transfer portal to be a parachute for a lot of those guys but yeah it's uh it's an interesting time that's for sure very interesting and you'll see a lot of uh you know, interesting approaches, whether it be Dave Aranda's, uh, that's, you know, quite different from, let's say, like Elaine Kiffin's, uh, or, you know, how Brian Kelly does it compared to, you know, how Lincoln Riley does it or whatever. But, uh, yeah, the transfer portal and, and, and NIL and all that, it's made things spicy. It's made things a lot more interesting, that's for sure. Yeah, it's it's certainly a new world. We'll take a break right here, literally. I mean 20, also, Scott. Uh, Dr. Man, he's with the athletic.com. He wrote a story yesterday about how the SEC and the Big Ten are trying to juggle their future schedules and how do they keep the rivalries intact? And there may be some rivalries that most people don't know about if you're not a part of a school or two that need to be kept intact and how they're trying to juggle that uh, as well. So we'll get into that a little bit with you uh, and also in the chat room. And the text line is 254-339-1122. One of the things, I, and Craig and I talked about it the other day, that's interesting, the SEC is is talking about doing this. It looks like they're going to do a nine-game schedule. And they're pretending like they come came up with the idea of a nine-game schedule. Okay. Because the Big 12 has been doing it. All right. 
You're right. Here's a quote from Nick Saban today on Brett McMurphy and the other timelines, but he's the first one I saw. I've always been, I've always been for playing more conference games from God. Uh, eliminating some of these great games that fans, players, supporters are not interested in. What is the best model? This is from Saban. That's the issue. Are other conferences going to play more conference games? Pac-12, Big Ten, Big 12. They play nine. And, and I don't know if Saban was just, you know, again. But, no, they, there already are three of the five power, five conferences who play nine games. I think Saban probably knows that, but he was also just throwing that out there as part of the question well, is they're meeting in Destin, Florida. The, the ACC is trying to figure out a way to play eight, uh, which I think would be bad for them because they're, they're not a great league and they don't need – they didn't need to throw – I mean, if they can throw a ninth game in there against, you know – that way you don't have UNC and Wake Forest scheduling each other in a non-con game. Like, you need to play those things so you don't create apathy. Does in Notre Dame in that conference count as a conference game? No. Okay. It's, but it's, they have a certain amount. I remember yeah. early on when we started the YouTube channel when someone was trying to say, no, they're a part of the conference, but they play a conference schedule in a way, but not a part of it. Their games, wins or losses, don't count for whoever they play that's a part of the ACC uh, from thick through thick and thin. So that was one of the quotes from Nick Saban also. Oklahoma and Texas have been part of the SEC schedule format discussions. They are not in Destin. They do not have representation there. Part of the quote to be a part of those conversations, Oklahoma and Texas do not have reps in, Des in Destin for the SEC meetings. Meanwhile, uh, the Big 12 is converging in Dallas, as I mentioned, for the governance meetings, the presidents, ADs, uh, women's uh, uh, senior athletic advisors, and among others, will be in Dallas, including Mac Road, Dr. Linda Livingstone, among some others. It's going to be a weird two years for Texas to not have their opinion matter in two conferences. Well, yeah. but you say that. I'm sure it does. They have like, been part of the SEC schedule format discussions. Yeah, but, like, they're not there, so, like, they it's like they're – they're going to come in, and that's what's weird to me is Texas is going to come in with Oklahoma in a couple of years, and they're going to be like, hey, by the way, we decided this without you. I hope you got the email. And Texas is going to have to just sit on that. So, uh, and right now in the Big 12, I mean, they're involved in things, but, eh, you know. We also know that they're kicked out of the room when other things yeah. are discussed. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they're kind of a team, uh, a group of teams with, uh, you know, dual allegiances at the moment and uh, really kind of sitting in no man's land. Now, I know where they're headed is, is very promising and there's a bright future there, so I'm not sure that they're really all that worried about it. But, yeah, they're kind of a team whose opinion doesn't really matter all that much right now. And I'm sure some would argue that, but I don't care to uh, because what I mean in that is that the Big 12 is making decisions that have nothing to do really with OU and Texas um, at this point. Uh, they're worried about their future, and, yes, they're worried about the present as well and how all this will exit, but they're having to worry about that because they're having to wait on Oklahoma and Texas to leave. Uh, so they're also making plans for after they leave. Uh, and then, you know, on the SEC side of things, I'm, I'm very interested to see how all that, that political stuff works out for them over there. You know, the, the big boy throwing the, the weight around the room like they were for uh, two decades in the Big 12 is just not going to fly the same in that conference. And I'm sure that they'll go in a bit more reserved and know that, too, and know that they can't just walk in there. Oh, I'm Chris Del Conte, Texas AD. Well, there's like 10 other ADs who couldn't give two S's less that he's the Texas AD. And so that's going to be different, but I'm sure they're going to, you know, be very well prepared for that and they'll pick their spots. And before you know it, I'm sure they'll be involved in some power play of some sort because that's just their history. Uh, but they, you know, they got a bright future, but right now, yeah, for those two teams, it's uh, just kind of a weird place uh, where you're, you're in, but you're out of, of two different conferences all at the same time. By the way, um, when Nebraska joined the big 10, I don't know for sure, and this could be just because I've forgotten with my age, but I'm not so sure their first year didn't have like Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Wisconsin, among everyone else in their division. They loaded it up, and that was like the every other whatever year. Uh, the SEC with Oklahoma and Texas, would that not be interesting if the, somehow they drew Alabama because they're maybe in the same division if they have them, or pods, but they won't be in the same pod. But then you add Georgia – Florida, LSU, which would be, you would think, is one of their or both their pods. Just, it, it'll be interesting but to see that's, how that But that's, why would the SEC do that? That would be against what they should be doing. I understand, like, from our perspective, I, you'd want to see them. I thought it would be funny if yeah. they did It'd be yeah. funny. It'd also be the dumbest business move the SEC could make because they're not trying to make these two teams look like they're, you know, not a part of the elite. They want them very much to come in and be 
part of their headliner of school. So, yeah, they would be funny from a Big 12 fan's perspective, but from the SEC perspective, well, that wouldn't. Yeah, and also, I think the fan bases at Texas and Oklahoma say, game on. It, They'd love to see those games. They really know, would. It also kind of works out for Texas and Oklahoma that they're leaving at a time where the entire idea of scheduling is changing. No, absolutely. So, so they wouldn't get dealt that, that hand because it's not probably possible anymore the way that the schedule is going to rotate. So, I mean, and like with Nebraska, you know, the Big Ten throws them that schedule because they had those rules. They're stuck with that schedule for several years. And maybe, I don't know. I, that, where I, it's going to be like that, what the new way scheduling looks like, where it's going to be, you know, 3-5-5 or 3-6-6, six, six, whatever you want to say, those scheduling models, you know, you're not going to have that, that schedule every year because it'll be one year on, one year off. And the thing about Nebraska – and you would hope if you're Texas and Oklahoma, there was a time when that schedule could have been that way and they would have been fine. Doesn't mean they would have run the table, but there was a time when they would have played that schedule and been able to hang with it. Speaking again of the baseball, we talked about Steve Rodriguez out. Top five reasons a nine game conference schedule is best. We talked about this a little bit with Scott Docterman, and of course the SEC meetings are going on right now and they're discussing, you know, the 366 format or the 1, I don't know, whatever it is, 1-8 format, which I think would, would kind of be a mistake. Um, especially like this, from Texas' perspective, you've got, you know, uh, they're coming in, you know, the, they're going to probably play A&M again, but if it's 1-8, you would think that Texas-Oklahoma outweighs Texas-Texas A&M just in, if you're going to play one same one every year, so then why would the SEC, you know, cut off their nose to spite their face on that one? Well, that's two but, big marquee games for and just, just that's just one of the schools right there. Yeah, I was gonna say though that's just one of the schools. But like, I mean, I could do that with everybody, but I just use Texas at the top of my mind. Yeah. You could, yeah. I'm just saying that like Texas won't be the, be the make or break. Like, no. oh, we can't have both of those matchups. Well, then let's scrap the whole thing. So yeah, it's uh, it's I mean, interesting. Like, yeah, yeah, Alabama, Auburn, but then you sacrifice, you know, Alabama. Uh, who's, Who? their sec- who's their secondary uh, LSU, you know, so like you sacrifice that one every year. So it, you know, you have Georgia, Florida, but you sacrifice Florida, Tennessee, you know, like, is that, is that really worth it? Because those are all, all good rivalries. So here are the top five reasons. Uh, le- number five, less games versus FCS late in the year for the SEC or probably in general, but those late year FCS games in the SEC really, really chap my hide. I mean, it's late in the year. All the games are supposed to be exciting. Yeah, but they've built it up to where their conference schedule is so daunting and it, and also the way they hype it. And a lot of those games can be, you can have a battering ram, but you can do that in every conference, that they sneak those in at the end and nobody's going to say anything. Although we've seen more people say something now. Like, oh, what about the game with Georgia Southern or whoever it might be or Tennessee Tech? They've been able to do that. And I would think the fans, the home fans, would rather those games not be played if they could play another SEC game. Yeah, I also think if you're the like a cross conference rival, you know, um, you know, if Georgia gets to play Towson in Week uh, 11 and Georgia Tech, I mean, if they were e- on equal footing, but Georgia Tech has to play, you know, North Carolina, then it kind of ticked off that you know i'm in a conference game and you're playing one that should have been at the beginning of the year at the end of the year yeah it's kind of a gimme week that yeah. they've built up in uh, propaganda to the point where we're like no yeah because it's so hard let them do that and mm-hmm. if it was any other conference we would slam them mercilessly yeah. for doing the same thing but they get a pass yeah number four it hasn't hurt the big 12 it hasn't hurt the pac 12 it hasn't hurt uh who else does it the nine game conference schedule pac 12 big 10 and the big 12 yeah it hasn't hurt anybody else so just do it i mean What's what? I mean, I, I know they're trying to, you know, you say lose a home harder, game. But, you can yeah. lose a home game every other year, right? If you play one more conference game, you lose a home game against the teams we just mentioned that allow you to fill up your stadium with those big, massive stadiums that most of the SEC schools have. One more time, that's one thing's financial. Yeah, I get that, but I, to me, it hasn't hurt. Does it really? Has it set the Big Ten back financially? No. Okay, no. then, no. then there you go. Uh, number three, strength of schedule will likely improve unless the conference, you know, somehow falls on hard times. And Everything is cyclical. You can say that like the NBA East used to dominate. Now it could be the West and then you whatever divisions in baseball. It's all cyclical, but this one has been more than cyclical. It's been going on a long time. Yeah, it has, and it's it's kind of rigged in their favor. I mean, if, if this was a pro sports league, then there's an, a draft 
to help out. There's no draft. There's no collective bargaining agreement. There's no revenue sharing. Uh, I mean, I guess there is revenue sharing, but you know what I mean. No I mean, parity there's, schedule. Yeah. There's, 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 there's no reason for them to not remain this way because it's pretty much been built up and calculatedly built up uh, to be this way. And uh, unless college football as a sport changes dramatically, uh, there's no reason to believe that's going to change anytime soon. Yep. Uh, number two, more games against teams fans care about. I mean, I, I like I, I the SCS thing too, but also maybe it knocks out not to knock the group of five, but some of the group of five games that you wouldn't want to watch either. So, yeah, you get more teams in the region that you care about, that you want to see. Uh, you get to see those teams more often as opposed to How would that hurt guys? and affect those schools that need those games against those teams when they get a million dollars well nothing works out for everybody i know i know Uh, you know and i I mean if you're relying on that to to float your athletic budget then that probably is a a warning sign anyways i mean i i know i know that not everybody can make the money to just be above water all the time but if you're relying on man we got to go to lsu and play them to make two million dollars to function then that's problematic that you're in that spot to begin with in my opinion yeah, that you that you're relying that heavily on that that game, but yeah, it does float other programs, and I don't know how those those programs would deal with that. But uh, nobody really cares about them. I mean, that's the message that I've been sent over and over by a lot of the moves and decisions being made. Are we suddenly going to start pretending like we care about the smaller schools because every move that's been made seems to say otherwise? Well, yeah, I mean, like, why do you all of a sudden care about the SCS if you don't care about the Pac-12 or the Big 12 if you're the SEC or Big 10? I mean, like, you're not making moves that are helping out teams that are supposedly on your same level. So If the Big one, 12 would have died off, nobody in the SEC cared. or it wouldn't have cared one bit. So, you know, we're all of a sudden going to care about well, Furman? Yeah, you know, like it's like what the Texas uh, when they said, "Hey, what about the other teams left behind?" Okay. Is it screw them? Screw them. Yeah, yeah I care. moved on along, and, yeah. and just didn't care if they all just, you know, packed up shop and were left, you know, with nothing. They didn't care. They they got what they wanted. So yeah, I'm not gonna for a second start to believe that they're all that worried about the smaller schools. Yeah, and number one, it will increase the likelihood of the expanded playoff because look, if the SEC has to play nine games, that means they could. The better teams could lose an extra game, which means that if they do that, then they'll say, well, we need an expanded playoff because we're the best league, and two losses in our league means something different than one loss in another league. So that means that we would have an increased likelihood of that's, that expanded playoff. That's more propaganda, too. Yeah, I know. Our, our two losses only count as everybody else's one. Like, that's – man, they it, really have it, just brainwashed the hell out it, of people. It, it is. I'm just trying to get it done however I can. And so if you have to feed into their propaganda to get that done and get it get it over with, then, then I'm all for it because that's what they're going to say. There is no so. college football playoff, any, any plan after 2025. So something has to change, and God knows if it will before then. Well, I've been holding on to this for a while now, but Greg Sankey talking uh, at uh, the meeting says – an 18 playoff without automatic qualifiers is something that we would consider. I uh, said he's the league's been open to the 18 playoff, but again, they all have to be at large selections. And of course, that would be the SEC's benefit right there, would be not to have automatic qualifiers because then they could, in theory, send three, four teams into half the field of the 18 playoff. But if you do automatic qualifiers, at best, they would get maybe three. Uh, so that's why they would not be for automatic qualifiers, but they are in favor of an 18 playoff. Um, and then he also mentioned that the, you know, the whole idea of an SEC uh, pl- championship uh, playoff, whatever, basically their own version of the college football playoff. Um, on that, it doesn't sound like it's very much of a likelihood, and it does sound like it's more or less just kind of like saber rattling, if anything. Uh, but the possibility of staging its own playoff, Sankey said, uh, according to Ross Dellinger, it was an idea that is still in a folder someplace and that he doesn't sound serious about the notion. However, there is no CFP plan beyond 2025, so plenty of options are on the table. And he, he basically said, like, we don't have any other options, so we're trying to come up with options. But I'll maintain that the SEC playoff idea, I think, is just really barking. I think it's like trying to get people to move uh, in, in, the, in the same direction and, and try to get something done. And that would not crown a national champion. That would crown the SEC champion, which we already have a championship game for. So uh, I guess you'd scrap the championship game, add a couple of teams or add six teams, and then do a little tournament. 
But that doesn't make very much sense because there's no scenario that really makes it make sense because it doesn't make sense. And, and that's why I'm not taking it all that seriously and don't believe we're going to see that. There's no freaking way, no matter how big their balls might be or how big they think they are, that they're going to allow one conference with 14 or 20 teams to dictate who is the college yeah. football national champion. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, there really. are some schools outside the conference who would laugh their asses off at even mm. the idea. But – you can do that because right now it's posturing. Yeah, but if you said, hey, we're in the national champion. Like, did you play Ohio State, Michigan, USC, you know, Florida State, Clemson? Did you play? No, Even you if you've to. beaten them 20 yeah. times in a row, you can't, you can't do that. Yeah, right? no, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's, again, I think it's just him kind of um, it's setting a shot the tone. At the alliance to me. Yeah, um, yeah it could be. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I think it's just more barking than anything. And I uh, said that something sooner rather than later regarding football scheduling will get done. But it looks like they're focusing on the single division model. Uh, and, you know, not so much what a lot of people have proposed with pods and all this other stuff. I guess in theory there would be pods because you'd have your one or your three regular opponents. Uh, so in theory there's pods. But – uh, looking like a single division model, uh, that's the direction they're moving towards. So a lot coming out of the uh, SEC meetings. All right, thanks to Emory Winter, Levi Kerr. Around this country as well. Jimbo Fisher, I don't mind playing eight or nine conference games. Brett McMurphy will join us today at four. I do believe this. We need to play FCS games, a game. I came from that league. Bobby Bowden came from that league. How did those schools make budget without a big payday game versus a power five? That's from Jimbo Fisher, who also was asked again about the teams that they would have, the three teams that they would play every year. And he goes, I'd love to play Texas. Also, Nick Saban, it's over with. We're done talking about it. There are a lot more pressing needs in college football. Well, that's kind of two different things there. Uh, Jimbo's talking about the schedule. Nick's talking about Jimbo Fisher. Uh, so that's that's kind of separate. But, yeah, on uh, Jimbo Fisher's comment, I mean, yeah, we talked about this yesterday that uh, those schools need a payday. I question, like, how much they need that payday to function. Like, if you need that game against A&M for a million dollars just to basically operate, then I think that that, uh, you know, is kind of an alarm of just how much teams are – programs or some schools are you know basically uh eking it out to play football i don't know how good that really is i'm not you know advocating getting rid of less teams so if they need that they need that but i think that that's alarming that they would need that little bit of change to just simply function their programs uh so you can definitely tell that there are some that make money and a lot that apparently do not uh but yeah i mean i you know, on the one hand, I agree with him simply on that point. On the other hand, it's Jimbo Fisher. And basically between him and Nick Saban and every really almost close to every college football coach in America, I take what they say at face value, and then I know there's some underlying motive to it. And uh, I'm sure with Jimbo Fisher, he sees the schedule they're going to play. And, yeah, I bet he wants a gimme game. I, I bet he does. And I bet it's not simply because he wants to save Furman football or Wagner or whoever else is because, hey, there's a win for us in the midst of playing Alabama and Georgia and Texas and everybody else. So uh, I, I believe a little bit of both of what he's – I believe a little bit of, of each side of, of what he's saying right there. I, on the FCS, I would like one of two things to happen there, neither of which is likely. One is probably more likely than the other. I would like to see maybe instead of uh, whatever bogus wonky spring scrimmage you get – you just play a scrimmage against an FCS team, and you can give you them. You mean a game. like in August? Like in no, like in in May or a April. Oh, a scrimmage yeah, like in the spring. I remember asking Art yeah. Wiles even back in the day. Yeah, like, I said, "Do you? Why don't you have a spring game with somebody else, or even a scrimmage in August? I mean, the against NFL, somebody else. The NFL, I know injuries the have, NFL does it in training camp, yeah, but, and then yeah. you know, so it works for them. I mean, if you're trying to be the NFL, and then the other thing I would I would suggest is instead of. Um, you know, instead of that, then maybe just a preseason game, which could also look. People are going to go. You're going to make money on it. You can give them the guarantee money, and you get to stay it. And then you don't have to stash it in week 12 uh, in play before the rivalry game. I don't know. I think the only thing with doing a spring game uh, where you actually play another team, which I do think would probably be valuable. I don't know why we we haven't seen that yet, uh, outside of just the rules that are in place. But between that and then talking about potentially fall scrimmage. Now you can't just do things. Now you have to go, okay, well, then what do the players want in return? Or what is that going to yeah. create? What problem is that going to cause? Is that going to lead to CBA? Is that going to, you know, and that's, that's the thing with every decision being made is it's now, and that's a good thing, uh, that the athletes are going to have their say in it as well, uh, or there's going to be blowback. So 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think you do need to have, uh, you know, some break in your schedule. I, I, that's why I think the whole the idea you know, that's ridiculous to begin with, but the whole SEC playoff thing, it's, you know, you're just playing the same teams you're already playing. Uh, so these FCS games give you a little bit of break in the schedule. It's good for those schools. You know, I, I think it's ridiculous how it's kind of stashed away late in the SEC schedule. We talked about that yesterday, but yet it's because it's them that we go, oh, well, they need the break. It's just so tough. Whereas if anybody else did, it would be like, wow, that's a really weak thing to have that, that game late in the year. But yeah, I, I, I think that the nine game schedule makes the most sense with the, the rivalries that you have potentially in place. It makes no sense for Texas to only have OU as a guaranteed opponent, opponent but not at A&M. Uh, it makes no sense for OU to have, uh, well, I guess really Texas is their big deal. But like Paul was pointing out yesterday, you've got teams that have multiple rivalries um, so a and needs to play Texas, but they also probably need to play LSU, and they also maybe probably need to play Oklahoma. So if you feel that way, then I think it's pretty simple. I, I don't know why there's too much hand-wringing over it. That seems the simplest solution is going to the, uh, the nine games, having your three stable opponents, what have you, so basically pods uh, in a way. And uh, that just seems like the cleanest way to do it and the way to make everybody happy. But I, I know that there is – you know, at least some other side of the argument, which is why they are still deciding on what they want to do. I just sent a text to Colby Carthel, the head coach at my alma mater at Stephen F. Austin, and I'm asked him, how critical are the, I should have done this yesterday evening. It's my fault. But how critical are the games you play against FBS teams on the road? For example, they've played at Baylor. They've played at Texas Tech. They've played at a couple other places. How much of that? Is it 300? Is it 500,000? Is it a million? Is it a million five? I don't know that, but I'm going to see if he responds to me. If he doesn't, by a direct message via Twitter, I'll call him in the break and just kind of get feedback from his perspective because I know otherwise that there are probably some budget shortfalls along the way. Now, uh, what the way? Now, uh, one of the other things that that I want to get into, and it's this conference schedule thing. I I don't think it's difficult. I think I think if you can play an extra conference game, you do. And that's, again, my opinion. It's not because it's been successful in the Big 12, which is unique because it's just one league, which is what they're going to. and Or the Big 10, they play nine, and it's a big league as well, but divisions, and they'll probably get away from that as well, or the Pac-12. If it, it, it has to me, are you guys, yes or no, if you're in the FBS, if you are competing for the college football playoff, Yes, your non-conference game can be better than most other people's conference games. Should there be a, a number that each conference plays as far as the number of conference games, or is that up to the conference? No, I think that should be uniform. No, I mean, I, and I think it should be uniform in that, you know, we've got a committee and it's looking for any excuse to leave somebody out, not to put somebody in. So I would think uniformity is important. And, you know, I, and I think as, as we – move towards a, a 12 team playoff which is the likely format that that comes then uniformity is going to be good because the committee is not going to be picking all 12 teams you know some of them will be automatically qualified based on the what was it the the top six conference champions not if they go the other route though yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, the yeah, sec yeah. just said yesterday that they're all for the expanded playoff but not if there's automatic qualifiers so if you got rid of the automatic qualifiers the sec would sign up today it sounds like at least from what they were saying just yesterday that's their and they've been saying for months that that's their big holdup is the automatic qualifying part so yeah, I mean, most of us think of it and we're like, yeah, if you win the Big 12, you should be in. Well, I think if you win the Big 12, you should be in. Like, I, 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 I understand part of the worry with the automatic qualifiers. The SEC is worried about getting as many teams as they possibly can into the tournament. That's why they feel the way that they feel. Everybody else feels like their conference champion should automatically get in. I think both can be right, but I lean towards those who, yeah, if you win your conference, then I think you should have an opportunity. Now, I know that that, that creates, well, what about if, like, the random team with four losses who has no business in the playoff wins the championship? Well, maybe they got hot at the end of the year and they're now one of the best teams. You know, maybe they played a really tough schedule. I don't know how you – you can't answer every single little issue that arises, but – But the, the first 12-team format that was put forth, which I really liked, was not necessarily automatic qualifiers because it was the top six ranked conference champion. So it wasn't automatic. So if the Big Ten champion happened to be ranked seventh, they weren't automatically getting in. Now, are they going to get in? Is the committee going to skip them? No. Every single was... conference should have an automatic qualifier if you're part of the FCS. I'm talking about if you're a Power Five. FBS. 
FBS. If you're an FBS Power 5 conference, I don't give a damn if you win a championship and you're 7-7 seven and seven or whatever you might be or 6. and You have to get in. I also think every single conference then has to decide, okay, how should we play a championship game? Should we just let the regular season be our champion? They're not going to take away that championship game because there's millions of dollars involved. But every conference, F, every FBS Power 5 conference should have an automatic qualifier, whether they decide it's the regular season champion or if they have a championship game in that winter. Well, there's some people like the SEC who don't agree with that, uh, right. clearly. And, okay. and, I, and uh, yeah, I know, okay, but I'm just saying that's, that's where the problem lies. That's why there's not a playoff is because not everybody agrees on that point. But I agree that, that yeah, if you win the Big 12 – the Big 12 champion should be in the playoff. I don't know how you argue against that because you, you throw out the random, like, well, this team maybe if be, perhaps because if this oh, they have four losses, they shouldn't get in. Like, that scenario, okay, if that happens every once in a while, then so be it. But last year, guess what? Baylor should have been in the playoff. They should have been. If there was an expanded playoff, they should have been in the playoff even though they had a couple of losses. So um, not everybody's going to be able to be perfectly clean at the end of the road. Uh, I understand why everybody's got to fight for their territory and all of that, but um, I, I do think, yeah, if you win your, you know, the Power 5 Conference League, then that just well, seems well, like a no-brainer to me. If the Cowboys win the East, are they in the playoffs? Yeah, yeah, no of course. No matter if they're 8-9 eight and nine or 9-8 nine and eight or 15-2. and two. With yeah. a new, well, and, and look, the, and then the, you have wild cards. It's very simple. Yeah. Well, that's the reason I liked the 12 team format because it wasn't necessarily all automatic qualifiers, but it kind of said if you do cross these benchmarks, you're going to be in. And then let's face it if you just base it on last year, the SEC would have had four teams in the playoff last year. So they would have gotten what they wanted. They're going to get the chunk if they yeah. remain the elite the way they are and who they're even adding. The teams, if they get back, if Texas gets back to being Texas and Oklahoma stays pretty much with who they are. Uh, we're not questioning the non-conference schedule of anybody. Some schools are really good about saying, we don't give a damn. We're going to go play so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so -and, -so. and Texas, yeah, Texas has one of them, yeah. really done a great job Oklahoma's with their non-conference schedule. Good. Oklahoma. This year's a bit and of a others. different one, but most years, yeah. So, uh, from our web, remember, uh, fair to say, the SEC and the ACC, the Big Ten and PAC, chose to play nine-game conference schedules for TV money, and the Big 12 had to do that for round robin. Uh, I think an equal number of P5 games is more important than the number of conference games. Our web, we appreciate, by the way. Conferences or whatever. And, oh, by the way, the SEC has been dominant but that doesn't mean they will be in 10 years. You may think that it looks as if that's the trend, but there was a point when the Big Eight, remember them, used to be the dog. There was a point when the Big Ten was the dog. There have been even points where other Pac-12, so it is cyclical, just like a division in the NFL or the NBA or somewhere else, that sometimes I, one division is stronger than others, and then now they go to the seedings based on just record. I'm not reading the chat room, but I already kind of feel a sense of something that kind of bothers me sometimes. Like, if you say anything that's anything relatively negative about the SEC, there's something that's like the, the army comes out from oh, behind no. the gates yeah. and is like, what was that? And it's you, so they don't play. And, like, after saying, oh, they play the hardest schedule and they do this and they do this and they do this and, and, and you know, just – putting praise all over them but then to point out that they they play a gimme game late in the season when everybody else is playing like deep in their conference that's a problem like I mean you don't, you don't have to defend them at every turn not everything can be perfect but I, I noticed that that's a trend for some reason that it's just like there's this backlash and it's like it's not that serious for one yep. and for two like there's no anti-SEC hate or anything like that do they not play a throwaway game late in the year? Have they not done that traditionally? They do. So I'm not saying anything that's not factual, but All right, okay. let me ask you this. Who was the last Pac-12 team to play for the national title? Oregon. How long ago was that? Uh, that was the... Right at the start of the playoffs. Florida State? One, yeah. No, they, they, uh, yeah, they beat Florida State to get in there. 14? Yeah. yeah, in 14. All right, when was the last... Besides Ohio State, when was the last time a Big Ten team played for the national championship? And I may be someone more recently than I realize. Wasn't prepared today for today's yeah. pop quiz. I mean, it's Ohio State, with the besides Ohio State, I'm trying to think. Like, it's I'm making a point. When was the last time besides Florida State and Clemson for somebody in the ACC to play for the national oh, championship? No, that's, it. that's it. So it's not just the Big Twelve with Oklahoma or Texas in 09. It is not just, but that, and that's where then the SEC name them. That's why they're. That's why they have that ability to kind of like, well, wait a minute. And I get that. No one's questioning what they've won and how many teams have won it. 
But really, all the other conferences around them are like, man, we got to hold up our end of the bargain, and none of the other four conferences really have. And that's disappointing. And until that happens, the SEC probably will dictate quite a bit, well, which is they've already done. But it's also easy to say none of the other conferences have held up their end of the bargain, yet every time you make a rule change, it benefits you and hurts them. Or they get left out of the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, yeah, like that's the thing. That's the thing that's such BS about this whole thing is like, yeah, they're the best and they, they, they need to be patted on the back, I guess, constantly. Because again, back to what I was just saying, it's like you say one thing that's not like praise and it's what? Um, like I get tired of talking about how great they are. Like that's that's been established. But yeah, TCU and Baylor. Could have been in a playoff. Yep. Got edge for Ohio State. Like Oklahoma State was right there knocking on the door last year. Baylor with a miraculous win. An expanded playoff. Both teams might make the playoff. So they're like right there knocking on the door. But because we only focus on the four teams that made it, you're like, oh, well, the Big 12s just outside of Oklahoma. They got nothing. It's like, no, there's been several teams, Oklahoma State, Baylor, TCU, that have all knocked on the door. And because they're not in the country club, they're not let in. Uh, and so, you know, the, you got to take that into account as well. Yes, there is a huge disparity. Yes, there's about to be an even bigger disparity money-wise. The SEC is going to be king. They're going to deposit all this. It's going to be so great. Yes, all of that. But when you look at the bigger picture, it's not like there's just nothing else over here, but that's what people the act like. The start of the season, they have two teams in the playoffs or four. Exactly. Before like, it's already season, set up. Before the season begins. A lot of that has been because of what they've done, and a lot of that is because it's like others can't imagine – God Almighty, Alabama can't be in the semifinals. And look, or, Georgia uh, Bama is still going. Sometimes gonna, no. Georgia Bama is still going to be the best teams every year. Like that's not going to change. But as far as like the Big Twelve and what they have or haven't done, well, they need to have a damn opportunity to be able to do it. And, and yes, their teams also need to, I guess, lose one less game to actually be undefeated or having like one loss that's deemed a good loss to be allowed to get in there. I mean, otherwise they have no chance because they don't have the benefit of, well, they play the toughest schedule. Oh, they make the most money. You know, all these arguments that we hear over and over again, it's like, yeah, but if you let them in, maybe they would knock around somebody. Maybe they would upset somebody, but we don't know because we don't get a damn chance to see it because if there's a spot open with the other three already taken up by the usual suspects, then guess what? That spot's not going to a TCU or to uh, some random ACC team or what. It's going to go to a team that we all can basically pinpoint and pick out of a pile. And before the season even begins, when you look at the top 10, there'll be four or five teams in the SEC among the top six or seven. Not that a lot of them haven't earned it, but how many of them have kept it once they're at that level? Probably two people. And LSU, of course, in, has had their run. And we understand others. Auburn, uh, Florida back in the day. It seems like it's been a while. All right. Uh, just wanted to kind of have that discussion because that's been on the table. Brett McMurphy will join us today at 4. On that, I just think that it should be easy. You sit everybody in a room. Everybody plays nine conference games. Why? Because, well, we think everybody should say. Now, what earlier when our web board on, on what he mentioned as well um and i and i love the response in the board when it comes to the, the the championship game why then i mean why protect a conference because they are concerned someone might win the conference who's not among the top eight or ten and twelve teams in the country you're still going to get if there's 12 i will book it i will bet a limb that they'll have four teams get in no matter what. They're getting right now two, and sometimes there's been argument they should get all four. Uh, I, I think that bad years for the SEC in a 12-team playoff will be three teams. Yeah. That'd be a bad yeah. year. Yep. Yeah. Like that, that means that there's, you know, a bunch of teams that are about the same level knocking each other off, and you have kind of craziness. But a bad year, if it was, if it was you know, a normal year, you'd get Alabama, Georgia, and LSU. You know, you're, you know, you're going to get them, you know, or, or whoever the – the revolving door third team would be. But, yeah, you're going to get three. And I think it's a fair point that, you know, the SEC brings up uh, or whoever he mentioned that, that brought this up specifically that, yeah, I mean, what about the team that finishes, you know, 11th or whatever and the, the 24th ranked team wins the Pac-12 conference? Well, that's just the way that it works out then. Like, I, I think to not do it because of this far-flung scenario of what could happen – like, then we could just never get anything but done. That's that's what we have every year when somebody goes, well, what happens when there's five undefeated teams? So the four, which and never happens. Gonna happen. There's yeah, barely so, even three. And look, sometimes I, not even two. I hope there is so we can yeah. wrestle with that. Yeah, so, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be challenge, insanity. But, Here's another thing. If you are 
who you are, and you are without question the best, most successful conference in college football. I I'm not saying you're afraid of anything, but you're going to get three or four teams in just because of who you are, unless it does cycle out, and most likely it will not. I don't understand that. You mean, so if you're not, you know, again, it's it, why? why? Let's not is dwell on the SEC such, part of it. Why but is that such a problem? I, I, well, they clearly, I mean, we've laid it out. Like, their reasoning is why. They, they, you may agree or disagree with their reason, but that's the reason. Um, and I don't agree with it. I don't care to say it. Uh, I think it's a stupid reason to not want to do it is that you're afraid that 16 might bump 9 from this 12 team or like whatever the scenario would like that's the thing is like we'd have to sit down and like write down the scenario that is their nightmare scenario and All figure right. out a way to make that work and i'm beating number two kansas state one year in the big 12 championship as an example k-state was still in the playoff right yeah that's what i'm, I'm just using examples that would have still been okay yeah uh, mm. texas beating nebraska in 96 in the first one Still would have been in the Both playoff. Both would have been in the playoff. Yep. Like, so what's the problem? I, uh, what's the freaking problem? Oklahoma lost to Kansas State in a, in a Big 12 championship game. Are you they worried? still would have been in the playoff. You worried you only get four instead of five? Because yeah. that's what it feels like. That It just feels like being kind of stingy. And I'll, I'll give you that there's three, probably on average, three teams every year that are playoff caliber teams. But I don't think there's necessarily five. I don't think, like, Mississippi State needs to get thrown in there at the end, you know, in, in a random year. I think if you got LSU and Georgia and Bama and – just say Tennessee got in there. That's not good enough. Like you need you need Oklahoma in you, there too. Like have, I mean, what the hell? You have thirty three percent of the playoffs. Exactly. At that point. If you're baseball, you're 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 in the All Star game. So yeah, you're you're fine. You're it's you're three thirty three. Almost like they're doing what's best for them yeah. and don't care no, about everybody else. Well, so are the Alliance schools. No, I know, but that's kind of what Brett was saying too. Is like that's the thing. Everybody's just being selfish. That's why nothing ever gets done. Mm -hmm. That's why everything gets pushed down the road. That's why everything, like, uh, basically, here, here, NFL, you're already here. You're successful, but here's December. Here, have this. You know what? We don't need January either. Here, have this as well. Why does that happen? Because they're all being super selfish and not looking out for the best of the game. But then they'll do interviews and they'll talk about, well, I just want to do. We got to play this, Jimbo. We got to play this non-con game against Tarleton State because we got to worry about all of college football. But yet. That's one example of you worrying about college football and then a ton of other examples of where you clearly do not give a crap about college football outside of your own bubble. So, yeah, I mean, what's the difference? I, I think it's all just uh, dumb politics, quite it, frankly. Well, it's kind of, yeah, no question. The 854 earlier today. For a while. One more note. Jim Skinner sent me a long email, a note about he watches the show. He's from Coral Gables, Florida. Jim, thank you. He said he's a big fan of the program sent me an overview about the money, the Big 12 money, about the TV deal, about comparisons of the various conferences and where the Big 12 is. According to The Athletic's Nicole Arbach, projected 2029 revenue numbers could be this. $1.8 billion for the SEC, $1.4 billion for the Big 10, $861 million for the ACC, $753 million for the Pac-12, and $690 million for the Big 12, which, of course, that would be about nearly $60 million per program in the Big 12. The board of directors knows this. His thought, and we have not, we've had this when we talked about next level because we've heard certain schools, Memphis, Boise State, if there isn't going to be a second phase. We don't even know that. Really don't. But I love this idea. The four most watched college programs based on data and what their academic standards combined are Navy, Army, Air Force, and Boise State, based on television numbers. I, 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 know, I know that's not going to happen. Boise State's been a part of that conversation, we know. And I think all of us, I would love that. I do. I know that Navy, Army, Army almost beat Oklahoma three or four, two or three years ago. They're pretty good, I know. But thank you, Jim, for any time you contact us, we want to make sure we can read it and give you the time from Coral Gables, Florida. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting info. Uh, the thing is, you know, it all comes back to is if you can add value, great. If you can come into the conference, no matter who you are, if you're Air Force or if you are Arizona or whoever the hell you are, if you can come to the conference and every Big 12 team with your addition is going to make a couple million dollars more or at least they're going to be making more, then, hey, let's explore it. But if you're going to come into the conference and everybody's suddenly making $4 million less than they were, because of your addition, 
then you it's it's off the table. So yeah, if you bring value, welcome aboard. Come on, but who does that? Trippy Springs quarterback. To figure out how to get their maximum viewers. So John Wilner, uh, who we've had on the show before, uh, had six suggestions. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on these suggestions for the Pac-12 to maximize their TV deal. And it could be things you could apply to maybe the Big 12 and, and other conferences uh, going on down the line. Number one, play early. Um, play some 9 a.m. kickoffs because based on the numbers that they would get uh, on John Wilner's, you know, kind of extrapolating out, that would be $3 million, which – most Pac-12 games don't really get. So how do you feel about 9 a.m. kickoffs in the Pac-12? Um, I live in the central time zone, so fine with me. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that's for the West Coast people to, to really, I guess, be up in arms over or have headaches about, you know, the thought of having to get up that early. We tailgating at like 7 a.m. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what the tailgate scene's out there, uh, yeah. quite frankly. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the deal is that uh, you just – see them on a randomly. Uh, you know, I'll do a 7 o'clock Baylor game and have three hours of a game, uh, which I did see, uh, you know, so, some of the things they're kicking around as far as shortening game ideas, including, uh, what is it, not stopping the clock after incompletions. I saw that brought up, and, and I definitely think that college football games last way too long. Like, yeah. I, I, def, I definitely am on board with that. They need to shorten these bad boys. But as far as uh, that in particular – uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that would get more eyeballs on the product because you'd actually have people awake to watch your product uh, in the rest of the country now for the West Coast. Um, I mean, that's where your fan base is. So, again, they won't be probably too excited about the thought of 9 a.m. kickoffs, but if that means that you're on at 11 o'clock in Texas and you're on at noon in New York and Florida um, and that's how you can get more people watching, then, yeah, I, make, I mean, I'd rather see them play at 9 a.m. than at you know, 9 p.m., uh, because how many people are watching at that point? I know I'm a sicko, so I love Pac-12 after dark, and it's a way to wind down during football season is whatever random-ass games on there, like Oregon State, Washington State, at like 1 o'clock in the morning. I love it, and, and fans that are up at that time love it. But, yeah, most of the country's asleep. So that, that, would, that would get them at least in a – time frame of when people are actually really tuning in yeah yeah and uh look he also says and i agree i think they should play i'm not you know at one night not, not all nine game nine a.m games a week but you know pack 12 could be the you know pack 12 for breakfast and pack 12 after dark at the same time because he also suggests that they play late that they they do continue those games and make sure that those games are not uh, some of those games aren't just kind of random Oregon State and Washington State. Maybe it's USC and Oregon. It's Pac-12 after dark uh, to make people stay up, you know, occasionally. Not all the time, but, you know, maybe make those a little bit more marquee or at least raise them to the mid-level as not to the low level. Yeah, I mean, if you want people to tune in to, to spice it up, having USC or Oregon or uh, Washington or some of those schools in versus who we typically see, because it does typically feel like it's like Washington State, it's Oregon State, it's – Utah, it's and hey, I love watching Utah, but um, yeah, I mean, I do think that if you're gonna if you're going to have to have those late games, which you clearly are, then actually making some of those the teams that people normally tune in for does make sense. Um, you know, I wonder on those teams ends like a USC, how opposed they would be to playing you know that late. Not that they don't do that on occasion, anyways, but I'll tell you the, the biggest mistake that I feel like that they probably make is on the marketing side of things because. Pac-12 after dark is like common lingo in college football. Fans know what that is. They know it's it's how you end your Saturdays. Is whatever late games on, you know, Pac-12 TV. Uh, whoever is playing is is how you're going to wind down. If not that, then it's like some random Hawaii game, right? Uh, but you know, I don't think I don't know. Maybe they have advertised it well, but it doesn't seem like the Pac-12s really embrace the Pac-12 after dark thing. And, uh, you know, maybe they have, and I've just missed out on it. Uh, I don't have the Pac-12 network like most people, and I don't feel like I've seen that many commercials really promoting it outside of just the normal commercials that we see. But if you tried to make that, like, your thing and really embrace it, and then, yeah, you got, like, USC versus – you wouldn't put USC-Oregon in that spot, but USC versus somebody worthwhile, uh, yeah, and spice it up and really, like, market it. It's Pac-12 after dark. Like, it's a, it's a big game for this conference that is unique because it's – 
after yeah. dark. Yeah, you know I think do. that would be something cool, but they don't really do that. Yeah, I wouldn't do USC Oregon every no. single year, but I would maybe do it once. Maybe you know, once like, for like the first time yeah. or something, you know. Yeah, throw it out there, make it interesting. You know, it's the you know, one of the, the bigger draws on that one. Uh play non conference games in November. This one isn't um possible during their current media rights agreement with Fox and ESPN, but could be written into the next one. Uh because, you know, Right now, the, the Pac-12 is like a lot of other conferences. Their non-conference is done in September, and, you know, that could shake things up and make things more interesting where, you know, you got to, you know, all of a sudden, you know, USC will play Notre Dame in November. That, that'll happen depending on Notre Dame's schedule or, you know, that BYU playing, was playing a lot of Pac-12 games. That happened, and those games cut good ratings. So why not do that for everybody else? Yeah, I'm not really big on the late switch out of conference games. Um, I don't really like. I don't like when the SEC does it uh, with the the gimme game that they have towards the end of the year. And we've talked about that. I mean, I understand everybody plays those opponents, but you know, I think the whole the messaging behind it of like, well, everybody needs a break in the SEC. I just think that's kind of bupkis, uh, quite frankly. Um, I, I don't know that, that that one week, you know, or a couple weeks stretch really makes that much of a difference, but maybe it does. I see it more as uh, this is a, a layup that we have towards the end of the year so we don't burn out our teams and we all stay in contention. That's how I see it. Uh, but, yeah, um, you know, if you have a – I mean, obviously USC Notre Dame works well. I don't know how you'd set that up because I don't know how everybody's schedules are and what kind of premier opponents they would have. And you do have to have some of those earlier in the year. But I, I suppose if you could, you know, sneak in a premier non-con game in like November or something, uh, that would be okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not – as on board with that one, uh, but I can see where there would be some attraction to that. Yeah, all right. So his uh, fourth suggestion would be adopt a pod system with pod A being the Washington and Oregon schools. So that's those four. Uh, pod B being the four uh, California schools and pod C being the Mountain Desert or the four corner schools. So, um, you know, uh, Arizona, Arizona State, uh, Colorado, and Utah um, would be that pod. And then that way it creates... Three annual opponents for every team. It's the only model that allows the California schools to play each other annually and preserve the Oregon and Washington game and guarantee the other natural rivalries. I mean, sure, I, everybody's yeah. gone pod crazy. Like, I just, everybody's I, talking pods, 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 and I'm just like, okay, like, that, it's... That might be the only conference where I really kind of support it working. I, I like the 3-6 model better, you know, something yeah, like that. Yeah, I do, yeah. too. I think, you know, what the SEC is apparently going back and forth over, everybody seems to feel like there's one solution that makes sense. Uh, I haven't given the Pac-12 as much thought uh, just because they haven't been as much out there on the forefront of the conversation. Uh, but, yeah, I mean... Um, if it, that preserves rivalries and, and somehow makes it more interesting for folks, sure. Um, you know, it's it's not going to affect me as a viewer all that much because I'm not a Pac-12 fan, so to speak. But if that's, you know, that's coming from Pac-12 folks. So, yeah, if you, if you think that'll make it better, then sure. Yeah. Uh, number five and number six, I'm going to say together, play the day before Labor Day and uh, play the day before Thanksgiving. Because nobody really owns the day before Thanksgiving. It's a Wednesday, uh, which I, that one I kind of disagree with because that seems like a – a Mac kind of a thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and plus, at that point in the year, do you want to have that really short week unless you can set it up to where you maybe play on a Friday the week before that? And then you've got a real wonky schedule on the back end, especially if you're, uh, you know, a really good team and you kind of draw that, you know, day before Thanksgiving rivalry that year for the Pac-12. Now, the day before Labor Day, I think, is great. I think there should be – there's no NFL games. There's one game this year on the day before Labor Day, and it's Florida State versus uh, LSU. So uh, – why not have a triple he like a triple header of non conference games on that day? Uh, that that's something I think college football kind of misses out on. Like they like like we talked about yesterday, not owning the month of December and now giving up more real estate in January. Uh, they could really own Labor Day, you know, or the day before Labor Day, because you know what else are you doing? What else could be on? Yeah, I don't really. Uh dive as deep into this as some people do as far as like the weekends and whatnot. I mean, I do know that the NCAA has really uh, relinquished their stranglehold on what should have been a stranglehold in the month of December and even parts of January, but, uh, you know, particularly December. So, yeah, I suppose if, you know, you feel like you can reclaim or you can claim a holiday weekend or a certain pocket of TV time uh, that is not already carved out for some other entity then uh, and make it your own, then sure. I mean, I'm all for just, you know, marketing and, and people, uh, you know, being able to promote uh, as best they can. So if playing on one of those, you know, holiday weekends or before or whatever it was uh, is a way to get more eyeballs on, you know, a game and on teams and 
uh, you have more of an audience uh, because of the timing of it, then, then that's great. I'm all for that, whoever does it and whenever they do it. But, uh, yeah, college football needs to do more of that and less of here, just handing it over to the NFL because we're all unable to see the bigger picture here. We're all too busy focused in on our cell phone pictures of ourselves. You know, that's because that's basically what it is. Everybody's looking at their own small situation, which is not small to them, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a bunch of small compared to the bigger issues facing them. When everybody's being selfish, uh, you have these bigger problems that, that come up, and uh, everybody's selfishness and uh, laziness and just, uh, I, I don't know, being an eye off the ball uh, has allowed the NFL to claim more and more territory that college football had there for the taking, and they just let it happen. And uh, if they can scratch claw back and find some pockets for themselves to, to be able to carve that out and make that college football, that's great. But, you know, they, they miss some opportunities, which is every topic known to man when it comes to the NCAA, you could say that about yeah. missed opportunities. Absolutely. Uh, Daniel Acton on the chat room, A&M in Texas used to be at 10 a.m. Uh, on Thanksgiving. There's moved to the Friday after yeah. Thanksgiving. You know, I, I went to that game when I was a kid with my dad. Uh, quite a few times at 10 a.m. Now, when you're a kid, it doesn't matter what time the game is. You're just going to, no. you know, I'm in the car and they tell me what to do. But some more students and, you yeah. know, are they going to get up for a 9 a.m. game after partying the night before? I know that's always a question, but uh, typically, you know, fan bases that got pretty loyal fans, they'll be there. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think it'll be that big of a deal. If, you, if you've got a student body that's into the games, they'll go whatever time the game is. I mean, and, yeah. and I mean, let's face it. Uh, we're talking about certain Pac-12 attendance. Mm-hmm. Does it really make a difference? I mean, yeah. it's not like they're packing stadiums left and right out there anyway. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know how much of a difference that would really make. I mean, I know USC is going to look massively different this year, but you've seen the stadium the last few years. Yeah. Very empty. Um, not nearly as jam-packed as it will be now with Lincoln Riley at the helm, um, you know, so long as things go well there. But, yeah, I mean, you, you put it in the morning and, hey, people want to get up and go to it, that's great. Make it a bigger matchup that should be more enticing for more people to go. And, um, you know, I think if you were to say, hey, the SEC is playing a 9 a.m. game, there might be some people that grumble about it. But if it's a big enough game and they're, you know, fans are passionate enough, they'll they'll get up for a 6 a.m. game. You know, it's, it's all about the fan bases and – and how enthusiastic they are. I think that is where the Pac-12 has hurt a little bit, is they probably have the least enthusiastic fan bases overall of probably the Power Five, and that's not a knock on them. That's just I think that's kind of consensus opinion, um, that it's not as big of a deal out there as it is to uh, the rest of the country. Now it will be again because USC will be relevant, so all of a sudden we're going to hear all sorts of California fans talking college football. But uh, besides that, it's typically looked at, at that way. So... Um, you got to do what you got to do to keep building the building the sport. And uh, maybe if at first they're a little hesitant to it, maybe the brand of football and the matchups themselves will bring people out early in the morning. But I know if they played a 9 a.m. game here, I, it would be hit or miss on as far as many people go. But the diehards, the ones that are there no matter what the opponent is, they don't need it to be a Big 12 team to show up. And I'm not talking about those that save up their money. I can only go to one game. We're not talking about you. I'm talking about just the fans in general that could typically go to any game. But selectively, um, that opponent's not good enough. I'm going to yeah. watch MTV or something. You know, like, that That crowd definitely exists, but probably for every fan base. But there would be diehards that show up at 9 a.m. no matter who they're playing. So I think uh, – I think they can make that work. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think you should. It, it just gives you more options, you know, f- to get your 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 product out there, and it's good for college football. It's good for look. I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care if I was, you know, <laughs> look. If Florida State was playing at nine a.m. or I was covering a game at nine a.m., I personally wouldn't care. But that's me. You know, look. I've I look at it as I get out early <laughs> earlier in the day, enjoy the rest of my Saturday. Look, look Craig and Smokey and I have had to be up doing pregame shows at six a.m. enough yeah. in our lives that like a nine a.m you know, kickoff would face us none. Yeah, so. Oh, I'm glad those days are pretty much over, <laughs> yeah, but, um, thankfully. Yeah, but, you know, it's just how it is. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'd be all for it no matter where it was. I, and, like, and, again, I'm all for college football doing things to, you know, widen things out so you, you have more opportunities to view things. So if that means that you can see more stuff, and part of the reason, Craig, you mentioned that everybody's kind of so selfish or kind of viewed on themselves is part of these TV times make it that way where you're only going to really be able to watch – you're kind of in your little bubble, but if you want the sport to grow, like part of the reason the NFL is, is so huge is that, you know, they've got games at every time slot that everybody wants to watch, you know? So if you're a football fan, you'll turn it on while you're waiting for your team to come on, you know, that, that's just kind of how it is. So uh, they've done a better job in that than college football has, but college football also is not a league. It operates as a bunch of separate entities 
in kind of a loose agreement with each other. Well, and there's three times as many yeah, exactly. teams. Yeah. Like, you can't have – I mean, you can spread it out. You can spread it out all day long. You can spread it out from 12 to 12 on a Saturday and have games – different every single hour if you wanted to do it that way. But, yeah, you oftentimes have, like, three big games all on at the same time in the afternoon, and that splits the audiences, even though plenty of people have multiple TVs and are going back and forth. But, yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's interesting ideas. I, I think a couple of those in particular would certainly – could be beneficial to the uh, the Pac-12 or to any other conferences that are looking to tweak things. I think everybody needs to be looking in the mirror and figuring out uh, not how we can make the most money, which is typically what they do. It's uh, how can we grow the fan bases? How can we make people care more? Yeah, you're going to have your diehards that are going to care no matter what. Um, but how do we grow our audience? I mean, that's what they need to be worrying about, not so much the money figures, but uh, it's college athletics after all, so the money will come first. But I think everybody is at a point now where everything's changing so much and the landscape's shifting so much that um, if you're going to get creative, now's the time. Uh, and I think the most creative folks are the ones that maybe don't have the biggest budgets will be able to create a nice little niche for themselves uh, in, in this current landscape. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Pac-12 – We'll see what their TV deal looks like. That'll be very interesting. Um, I think the USC Lincoln Riley timing is is really a boon for them. Um, and outside of that, I mean, I kind of wonder what would be the excitement level because I don't know what it is. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, UCLA and Chip Kelly are pretty good. You know, Oregon's probably going to be pretty good. Utah's going to expect it to be good. But, like, overall, what's really the story is USC and Lincoln Riley. And without that – um, I, I sort of wonder timing wise, doesn't it go, I'm like Lincoln Riley's not going to make their contract go up by $20 million, but I bet you it does make it a lot more enticing than it was when Clay Helton was the head coach at USC. Well, and, and I wonder if there was like, you know, maybe not pressure, but suggestions from the rest of the conference. Like, Hey, can you guys help us out and, you know, do something here or like, or at least not the conference, but you know, the powers that be around it, like, Hey, make sure that this hire is good, you know, so that. You know, there's more yeah. I don't interest. know if they do that. Hey, USC hire somebody yeah. good so we get a good TV no. deal. But I, I think maybe Kleofkov would be like his. The people that patch up office would be like, hey, you know, think about this a little deeper than just like, should we just keep Clay Helton here? And I'm not trying to knock the guy, but he was not a USC head coach. Like that was not what his his path should have been. You know, and it you know also took a new athletic director and a new, you know, view and new new people giving money and injecting that in the program for them to kind of get out of this like, hey, this guy won the Heisman Trophy. Should he be the athletic director? Oh, this guy was really good in the NFL. Should he be the athletic director? Was he qualified? Is he a fundraiser? Well, or? I think they saw the writing on the wall when they realized that the gap between them and the uh, eastern half of the country was growing larger and larger. I think that's what they saw. I don't think that hiring Lincoln Riley had anything to do with the Pac-12. It had more to do with the USC, but I think the Pac-12, like I said, timing-wise got very lucky mm -hmm. because if it was still just Clay Helton sitting in that role, I don't know how much we're talking about what the Pac-12 could potentially make. We're talking about it, but again, what's exciting about it? Mario Cristobal is not at Oregon. I mean, they got Dan Lanning. That's great, but like, is there an excitement level there outside of Eugene? I don't know. I don't see it. I don't feel it. I see less Oregon right now than I saw when Cristobal was there on my timeline. Maybe there's just less Central Texans there recruiting or something. I don't know. But there's not like a palpable buzz coming out of Eugene right now. Yeah. It's just like, we'll see what happens. UCLA is just like, we'll see what happens. Everybody's pretty much, Utah's like geared up. Like, yeah, they're fired up. But, um, you know, outside of that, USC is like the story in the Pac-12. Washington's just, they're there. Um, there's a lot of teams capable of being huge brands, but outside of USC's buzz over a coaching hire, not even the on-the-field product, that's the only buzz coming out of that conference right now, really. So, uh, again, timing-wise, for the TV contract to be coming up and negotiated, you have this buzzy, shiny brand that is your beacon, that is your, your big, huge franchise that is now feeling itself again and actually getting money poured into it again because the fan base is excited again. So... Uh, that's what I'm just saying is timing wise, it worked out well for them. Cause there's actually some, some excitement around the pack 12. I don't know if that'll make a difference as far as the money that they're going to be approached with, but I think it could make uh, a little bit of a difference. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We'll take a break right here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, into the chat, uh, talking about the three, six and some of the, the games they think, uh, Garrett, I want your opinion on this since you are decked out in, uh, 
purple and gold today. Um, but uh, Show Memo says, I just know as a Tiger fan, we want Texas. We still have Arky and who knows the third, so Arkansas. So Arkansas, Texas uh, for LSU, and I would think A&M would be the third. Who would you want to see as your three in that as an LSU fan? Uh, I definitely want to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not on yet. No, nope, nope. still not on. Still not on. Garrett's still working out yeah, the kinks yeah. a little bit. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't get to get uh, this mic why. time all that often. Oh, you have to plug in the microphone. Yeah. There yeah. we go. There, there we go. go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the three definitely want to see Bama. Um, I would like to see Texas A and M and Florida. Those are the three yeah. I would like to see every year. It seems to me, and and people, you know, outside the southeast may not realize how much Florida and LSU straight up hate each other i cannot yeah. stand florida yeah i despise it's it. easy i mean but <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean they, they straight up hate each other that shoe game a couple years ago cost florida uh a lot i mean a lot i mean it, it essentially cost dan mullen his job at florida eventually and that was probably one of the greatest things that happened to lsu all season long yeah absolutely yeah so i don't know what do you think about that pot for lsu i like what'd you say again he said a&m florida A&M, florida and alabama yeah, that sounds right. I don't think they need to force LSU Texas. I mean, I yeah. know Texas would probably love that, but then again, I mean, they they should have Oklahoma and every, Arkansas. They get them every other year. You yeah, know, so, yeah. I, yeah mean, I mean, so it's but I'm I mean, as far as a permanent opponent, I'm sure that you know Texas would love to have LSU as a permanent opponent, and, yeah. and for certain reasons, um, you know, I'm sure they would love to become a bigger LSU rival than A and M is, you yeah. know, and that kind of a deal. But uh, I don't think you need to force that one. A uh, and M's already kind of got that. I mean, they intentionally set those two teams up to become a rivalry pre-OU in Texas. So, yeah, I mean, there's certain teams that are going to have four or five good candidates, and there's going to be some that have, you know, maybe two. Uh, but I think that that sounds, that sounds like a good little plan for, for LSU as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, for me, if I'm A&M, I, I'm saying, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, or mm-hmm. Texas, LSU, and Arkansas maybe. Uh, you know, but that's, again, that's four candidates. Like, you can switch it. Yeah, so Texas, LSU, and Arkansas – to me, would be the best for AM. Who's Oklahoma playing? They're playing Texas. They're playing, yeah. I mean, what, like, Arkansas because they're next to each other, I guess. Yeah, and they wear similar colors. I mean, mm. is is that the reason for the rivalry? I mean, I know there's some history there, but it's not like there's Oklahoma Texas history, or Arkansas Texas history. Uh, so, yeah, I'm curious who Oklahoma fans out there would want to see outside of Texas uh, because there's not to me a, just a natural. Like, oh, that's perfect. Like, you know, we just rattled off three for A&M. We can rattle off three for L. And there's going to wind up being some random ones like Oklahoma, South Carolina. I mean, it's not going to be that. But, like, you know, there's going to be some because you can't make it all work. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, somebody's not going to have, like, the perfect setup necessarily because you can only do it so many different types of ways. So, yeah, I'm curious to see uh, who Oklahoma's other two would potentially be. And that's why you can have this conversation. But if you do the one – uh, model, uh, then you're like, who's your one opponent? Well, that just leaves so much on the table. That's that just doesn't make any sense to me. And and I understand that, you know, like Zach Barnett said, it's to boost the teams at the bottom of the standings and help get them bowl eligible. Basically, is you know right? That's basically the reasoning you're worried about what Kentucky and Vanderbilt and, and those schools will have to deal with. But I don't know, man. I think you, you need to be more worried about. And I understand why. I, I'm certainly not going to suddenly become elitist guy, and I'll screw what the little teams think. Uh, but, you know, I think it's more important to, to make sure you have the biggest, baddest battles possible versus the last place team feeling like they're a part of the club too. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, you know, o- Oklahoma, you know, it could be Arkansas, Mizzou, and Texas for them. But yeah. does that, like – Really do anything for Oklahoma fans? I mean, Oklahoma, Mizzou, I didn't really – I mean, I forget Missouri's even in the SEC (laughs) half the time. I really do. Um, You know, it's not intentional or anything. I just don't think about them all that much, quite frankly. Uh, But, yeah, Oklahoma, Missouri, that would – you know, they had some good battles in the Big 12 back in the day. I don't know how exciting that is for Oklahoma fans versus the other options because there's like six other options that are way sexier. But at least there's some history there. So, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And, look, if I'm, I'm a Florida fan, I want LSU, I want Tennessee, uh, and I probably want Auburn. I mean, but, I mean, they're probably going to wind up getting South Carolina in that Who one. wants Bama? Yeah. I, I mean, mean, Auburn and Bama is going to be a LSU. thing. Too. Tennessee and Bama is going to be a thing, and LSU and Bama should probably be a thing. Yeah. You know, um, that's just, to me, the, the best TV thing because Bama and Tennessee have that cross-conference or cross 
divisional rivalry going back forever. And before they had divisions, that was a huge rivalry. So. I do think it's great, though, that everybody's acknowledging that everything got a little stale. Because yeah. I, I do feel like it did. I, I do feel like, you know, not – I mean, still no Georgia A&M matchup at this point, right? I mean, all these years they've been in – like Johnny Manziel's like in his 30s now and they still haven't played each other, which is just ridiculous. Um, so I, I'm glad that they're they're shaking it up. I think it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, the first time this doesn't work out where somebody like loses a playoff spot because they did it this way, you know, the complaints that will come. But I think ultimately it'll be – a lot more positive than than negative, and and college football's scheduling definitely need a little bit of a shakeup. It did feel like we were seeing pretty much the same things over and over and over again. So, um, you know, I I feel like the Big Twelve with just the ten teams actually became a lot more exciting because you didn't avoid anybody and you had you knew you had to face every single team on the schedule. Now it's not possible to do that in all these other conferences because there's too many teams, but. Yeah, moving away from like, well, we have to play all of our divisional opponents, so that's why you won't see this team, you know, a few hundred miles away for seven years before you see them. I'm glad that's going to the wayside. I think that is ridiculous. Yeah, and, and, and look, I think it's – it'd be look, the Big Ten probably has the same kind of problem. We don't think about it as much, but, um, you know, they've got 14 teams. and uh, They just don't have nearly as many brands that matter yeah. to, I think, the general public because if the SEC, you can rattle off like seven of them, and, and now you include OU and Texas in that. So Florida, Georgia, LSU, Bama, Auburn, Tennessee, Oklahoma, I mean, think – and then the Big Ten, it's Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State – I guess we'll throw Michigan State in there. I guess we'll throw, you know, who? I mean, I mean like, you should throw Nebraska, this, but they are yeah. where I they mean, should I, be. Iowa? Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin, you know. But then you've got, like, you know, Purdue, Northwestern, Rutgers, Maryland. Right, that's what I mean. You know, like, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, there's not – like, again, like, if, if the Big Ten does the same model, I'm sure there's going to be somebody who's stuck with the, you know, Rutgers, Northwestern, Purdue – Three that's like, well, you know, Indiana, you know, that's not, it's not a football school. It's, Illinois. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> like I mean, it's, it's fine. It's, there's just a lot of teams that are like, okay, fine. Yeah, whatever. But I mean, it's really been a two horse race and, and maybe a four or five horse race. Uh, yeah. Michigan State with Mel Tucker and Wisconsin's been super steady and James Franklin, Penn State. I don't know if they've tapped out or maximized their potential. It, it kind of feels like that. But, you know, they're still one of the upper echelon brands. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the schedule, like I said, shakeup is good. I'm curious the first time it goes awry and how that occurs, you know, to where it's not the perfect model moving forward um, because there's always going to be, you know, nothing's ever going to be totally perfect. But I do think there's going to be a lot more good that comes from it than, than any negatives that come from it for sure. Yeah. Uh, from And I clearly a lot of people are talking about it. Like, yeah. that's the thing. Like, I mean, uh, if this weren't happening, then – I'm sure there would be some college football topic people would be discussing, NIL or some something like that. But uh, I think it's been kind of eye-opening to me to see how many people are into schedules. Like, I've never been this into schedules or given it that much thought. But there's clearly a lot of people giving it a lot of thought, and that's great. It's obviously, you know, change is not always necessarily good, but I think in this case it is. And I think if it's creating a lot of conversation that's mostly positive, then that's, you know, good for college football. Yeah. Uh, Razorback MZ23 says Hogs get Texas OU and Mizzou. Texas gets Hogs OU and A&M. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I wonder, uh, yeah, that Arkansas is interesting because Texas and Arkansas was a fantastic Southwest Conference rivalry, but that's been 30 years now. So, yeah, it's a lot of Southwest Conference fans that that love talking about that. And unfortunately, Southwest Conference fans have aged pretty pretty much at this point. To to my point being that you got a lot of older fans now who are you know recalling the glory days of that conference. And dude, I'm like I'm I'm pushing 40, and I don't have like hardly any recollection of it whatsoever. So do you think somebody that's 23? It's like, oh, the old Southwest Conference. No, like they have no idea what you're even – they're like, Southwest what? The the huh? Like the Big 12's changed 17 times since the Southwest Conference was in existence. So I think for the older fans, there's like that that heartwarming feeling of, you know, days uh, days gone by and all that, and that some of that will be rekindled. But I think there will be a newness to some of these. That, that There will be a newness to some of these old rivalries, so to speak, that will be, that will be cool and refreshing. Yeah. If you want it, like a good example of how younger people feel about the Southwest Conference, try to get somebody in their twenties to watch the Goonies. 
<laughs> like that, like it's a great movie, especially for our generation, Craig and Gary, you know, it. like it's a great movie. We all love it. It was a great movie when we were kids. We all love the Goonies, but trying to tell, you know, like Jack and, and Levi and I'm sure Emery likes the Goonies. He's cool. Uh, but, uh, but trying to tell them about it, they're like, well, I don't know. I really care about, you know, a bunch of kids finding treasure in Oregon. Like it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. You know, so it's hard it's to feel like, about Avatar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't like Avatar for a different reason. I just don't, I get into. I, I just don't yeah. know what the hype's all about. Really quite. I mean, I guess it's technological hype, but outside of that, it's like, okay. Well, it's a remake of Fern Gully. And Dances right. with Wolves, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. that intersection right there. Yeah. Plus, there's weird. That tail thing is weird. I don't know. I just yeah. never cared about it at yeah. all. And like the announcement that they're make the sequels are finally coming out. I see all this, you know, pandemonium over it or excitement. I'm just like, do not care at yeah. all. I can just it never registered with me. Never made a dent in my brain as far as like, oh wow, look at the special effects and all of that. But um, I don't know why I'm randomly slandering Avatar. But yeah. yeah, you know, just some things that some people appreciate that others don't. It's a passing of time and yeah. just different generations. And so yeah, I mean that's. It's going to be uh, cool for the older fans, like I said, to see Texas and Arkansas, even though they've played since then, uh, you know, a few times. But to see it on a year-in, year-out basis, and to not only see that, but see, also see A&M and also see Oklahoma now, I think that's going to be really cool. And uh, we'll bring, you know, some new chapters to these these old stories and legends that Grandpa, you know, Dad and whoever have been talking about for all these years. Uh, they'll finally get to see some of, you know, what – uh, the Southwest Conference meant just in a, a different arena. Yeah, and uh, let's see. Uh, Brandon Reese says, uh, Sports Illustrated had Florida and OU as each other's permanent opponents. I kind of huh. like that. I kind of like that. That that would be – plus it forces a permanent opponent across regions of the country in a, in a, in a, a wide-spanning conference, which I like. Well, I mean, there's two ways to do it. You can go the very easy route of what's comfortable and familiar, and OU Arkansas, OU Missouri, OU Texas, that makes just very easy, simple sense. Um, but, yeah, if you want to, sh- you know, shake it up and spice things up and not worry so much about the Southwest Conference, you know – uh, nod, then yeah, uh, I'd be all for, I, I mean, I'm, I'm up for whatever. Like, you know, I, I have grown up an Oklahoma fan. If they ended up saying Florida, LSU, Bama, like that would suck for them as a team, <laughs> but man, it would be, you know, exciting at least initially. <laughs> um, but I'm not locked into like, yeah, they got to play the teams that they already have a relationship with. Basically the last time Florida and Oklahoma faced off, uh, you know, urban Myers crew took it out on them, uh, Aaron Hernandez and, Tebow and Percy Harvin and uh, Brandon Spikes and all those cats uh, took it out on OU in the national championship game. And uh, that's the last time they've met. So I, I think that would be a cool, unique, and like, fresh new – like that's, that's what I'm saying is are they trying to go all like let's dip into the history here and preserve that? Or do we want to actually use this opportunity – to create some new history, and with Oklahoma, Florida, yeah, I think you would do that. I'd be all on board. I'd be on board with OU Tennessee, or because when they played a few years ago, I think that series worked out. You know, it worked out in Oklahoma's favor. They won both those games, but I mean, just the, the feel of it was pretty cool too. Uh, so yeah, I'd be all on board for OU. From the three hundred four, I would love to see a twelve-team playoff in college football and home playoff games. Your thoughts? Uh, look, I'm all for the twelve-team playoff. Um, I would be for anything up to 16. Like, I think after 16, you're probably uh, – 16 even convolutes it a little bit more. But, like, I I would I would embrace a 16-team playoff, anything other than that. But I think you're going to have to do home playoff games in the first round. I'm not on board with 16. I think that's starting to get into yeah. too much territory. Um, and, you know, do we want to see five SEC schools in the field of 16? Yeah. Because that's probably what it would turn into. Um, me personally, no, I don't want to see that. Um, we're already going to get four of the eight probably or you know, three of the eight. Um, I don't necessarily want to see five of the 16. And I don't think that, you know, in most years, your fifth place SEC team, um, and, and not just trying to pick on them either. I'm really, I'm really not, but they're just who we all center around basically. Um, I don't know that they deserve a shot at the national title. The yeah. fifth place SEC team that we're no. again, or even the fourth place SEC team, SEC team that we're again. I think you're looking at your top two or three teams in any given conference, and some may not even have two or three. Um, but th- outside of that, I think that that's that's a little bit too much. But yeah, I'm I'm cool with the twelve. I think it's a nice compromise. Now, as far as the playoff sites, I, I think you have to do the home initially because I mean, what are they expecting as far as people's travel? I mean, that's, that's been the big hang-up with the playoff is, like, if you suddenly turn the bowl games into, like, you know, quarterfinal rounds or whatever, 
So the Boca Raton Bowl is suddenly like your first round game. Well, if you're an Alabama fan having to, which, you know, just, just throwing something out there. But if you did where it was like all these bowl games suddenly, well, I don't know that all these bowl games are going to be excited sharing the same team, you know, three weeks in a row or, you know, three weeks over the course of five weeks or whatever it is. So, you know, in theory, Alabama would play in the Boca Raton in the first round and then play in the – what the the sun in the second round, and then they'll play in the fiesta in the semis, and then they play they play in the road. Like, how would that even work? So I, I don't think that that would fly. And and just to travel, like, there's few and far between fans, even the biggest boosters that could jump after a full regular season of travel, and then go you know to L. A. for a first round game, and then to. Uh, Miami for the second round game, and then you got to go to Arlington for the third round game. I mean, people, well, especially right now, like I don't know how many people are going to be able to, I, to do that. So, yeah, I think you have the home games. There should be a benefit to finishing higher. Uh, you earn a home playoff game, and that's an incentive. And then, you know, yeah, then you spread it out and you, you move it to maybe more of a neutral site in that second round, and then you, you have your bowling corporation uh, those last couple rounds, or I guess however you do that. But, yeah, first first round, I think just for the sake of people's wallets, you got to make it a, a home game for at least one fan base. Well, and, and you can't, like, the, the cool thing about the NCAA basketball tournament and why it works for them, so many places where you can travel three weeks in a row uh, and do that is, well, one, the, the you know, each week the – it gets less and less of the fan base, which would be the same way. But, you know, you can, because the NCAA tournament is in a city, count on selling out like a third of the state, selling a third of the tickets from just basketball fans who just want to come and sit and watch it because it's there in their town, yeah. which I don't think you can necessarily do with. No, there's multiple the, games, yeah, too. Exactly. You're not just so, buying for Baylor, you know, Oral Roberts. You're also getting Cincinnati and Akron, and yeah. you're getting Texas and Wisconsin, and you're getting, you know, Pitt and uh, Syracuse. So, yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah. So, that, it's not... You're not going to get that if it's, you know, um, LSU versus um, Michigan and playing in El Paso. Like, you know... No. Yeah, no, no, that would make sense. And then it, would, it wouldn't be make sense for the teams that, you know, want to go to El Paso and play in the Sun Bowl yeah. because it's a big deal for their program to get to a bowl game and be, you know, in a bowl game. But... Yeah, so the point being, like, the, the whole bowls that hosting throughout or neutral sites throughout, I think that would be pretty problematic, ultimately. You'd certainly have your diehards that would make it work, but I think for the fans' sake that, yeah, you... And just, it makes sense. Like, you should have an incentive if you are one of the, you know, let's say the top four teams or whatever. I think it just makes sense that you would have... Uh, some home field territory. And why would you not want to bring it to some college stadiums? Like, it's yeah. college football. It's not the NFL. We don't need everything in Las Vegas. Um, I, I understand why we take everything to Las Vegas or to Los Angeles or to Arlington and the same places over and over. They can all still be a part of it, but I just don't think it needs to be the whole playoff. I mean, it's college football. So, yeah, let me see a first-round game, Alabama hosting Wisconsin and Tuscaloosa, you know? Yeah. And, hey – you know, Alabama would have home field advantage. Well, they're one number one or number two seed. They deserve home field advantage. You know, like that just that makes simple sense to me. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Plus, it 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 will cut down on costs a lot. Yeah, a lot. We're kind of living in an inflation period right now. I don't know yeah. if everybody's noticed, and and just in general, you've got the money going towards NIL now. I mean, that's eating into boosters' pocketbooks, and I know some of them will never even feel it. Um, but that that's the the minority. Um, you know, and even then, people with a lot of money still there's a there's a point eventually for many is like so i i contributed one million to this uh nil fund and i'm also got season tickets for the whole family and i've also got travel like there's some people that can make that swing but the the average person as diehard as they are i mean it's probably going broke well, trying to travel around and follow every single playoff site and do all of that yeah I, and look not every school is as big as ohio state too so like right if you're baylor you know, but, um, that's, but I mean, like just a, a size of school like that, yeah. you know, and you've got three, you know, potentially three games. Well, you know, hopefully one of them's a, a home game and then maybe the next one you're going to have less people have to travel to, but you're going to have maybe less people than you would if it's a championship game because people are holding out hope that that's the one they're going to spend their money on. And that always brings me back to uh, Baylor as a small school and why I was told by a former college football player who knew some people that were a part of the committee that Baylor would never make it because they're too small and they wouldn't be able to bring the crowds for multiple games. Uh, he was told that by somebody that's apparently in the know. This was years ago at this point. 
And so we were having a conversation about, you know, it's Baylor and their playoff chances and all that. And he's like, I'm just telling you right now, like, if there's any decision, like, they're not going to invite Baylor because it's too small of a school. And what are they after? They're after money and they're after packing the stadiums. And, and I understand that concern on their part, but it's also kind of a BS reason for a team that's deserving to be in a playoff potentially to not get it because their fan base is too small. But then again, we are talking about a sport that basically tilts everything towards the big boys. And so, um, you know, this would – an expanded field is pretty much their only chance other than going undefeated. Yeah. And and I don't know how it would work as far as if they played at Santa Clara in the semifinals and played in New Orleans in the national championship game. I think Baylor fans would make that work. But, uh, you know – uh, that does have to come into consideration. But, I mean, and, and Baylor's not the only school that would have the problem. No. You know, like, it, but they are kind of unique in that. Like, not unique, but they're not, you know, I'm just using that as an example. Not everybody's you know. Michigan and Ohio State with 100,000-plus, you know, 20, you know, uh, alums in their 20s or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they don't even probably have 100,000 total. Uh, I mean, maybe they do, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's a ridiculously different size uh when we're talking about yeah. these schools. Yeah, watch some of the commercials like the big schools like Ohio State. Well, they'd be like, 9 million. I know it's not that, but like, right. it sounds like that. Like, this many hundreds of thousands or a million alumni worldwide. You're like, mm -hmm. well, dang. Nobody, I mean, you know, Ohio State could play a game, you know, in, in Kinshasa, and they'd probably have enough people show up to make it worth their while. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're huge. Not everybody's like that. So, anyway, all right. Uh, in uh, in the NHL, and uh, you know what? Uh, I saw some Big 12 odds that were released. Uh, Texas, uh, this was from CBS Sports. Uh, some of the odds released by Caesar Sportsbook has Texas as the favorites to win the Big 12. Now, I know some of this is like, we need to get people to bet money, so let's put, you know, there's some of that to it, but there's also, you know, Vegas knows their stuff. They know their stuff to a scary level, actually, um, at times, but Texas... Plus 175, Oklahoma plus 200, Oklahoma State plus 400, Baylor plus 600, fourth best odds according to Caesars. And then Iowa State, big jump, goes from plus 600 Baylor to plus 2,500 for Iowa State, plus 2,500 for K State, TCU, Dub V, Texas Tech plus 6,000, and then Kansas plus 30,000 odds. They drag up the rear, according to Caesars. So uh, there's just a kind of a glimpse at uh, how Vegas is viewing the Big 12, and those are a few things off the radar. But I bet every penny that Levi has on, uh, on Kansas. I would be interested to know if there's any diehard Baylor fan who bet big on them on like a trip to Vegas as yeah. far as winning like the Big 12 title or something last year because they couldn't have had very good odds. And, you know, coming off of – the season that they had previously, I, I would imagine somebody who's just a fan said, oh, what the hell, throw 100 on the Bears, and that would have worked out pretty well for you. I don't know. I don't think it would have made you a millionaire, but it certainly would have put a few thousand in your pocket. So, yeah, if you want to check out, uh, if you're a betting person, then uh, there are some Big 12 odds from Caesars. Yeah, I know. Somebody I know went to Vegas and made – Made like five thousand bucks betting on Baylor something, but I can't remember what it was. It was either football or men's basketball. Dude, and if I if I went out there, I'd throw down some just random bets. Like if I had you know money to burn or money to save up just to throw it. Like, hey, I'm gonna use this on something superficial, anyways. Might as well just put it up for grabs and see if you know it can make some money. But yeah, if I was out in Vegas around this time of year and I saw my random college football team, I'd throw a little you know a little action down. Could have a could have a Baylor type year where you go from two wins to, to twelve wins and you know a couple of championships. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll take a break when we come. Our faces is long. All the conferences are over her looking perhaps the best university candidate for addition. No one is mentioning the San Diego State Aztecs. The record of the Mountain West is among the best. They have a big time coach in Brady Hoke, and we can argue with that. Uh, but most attractive. Um, they have terrific facilities, a brand new stadium, but most attractive to conferences are the recruiting in San Diego County. Uh, they have the most Heisman Trophy winners of any city uh, in four. Um, uh, Reggie Bush um, uh, and Ricky Williams uh, among them, or what's Ricky Williams' new name? Oh, I Eric. don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. It was, Eric it something. Eric. Eric uh, is his wife's last name. Yes, yeah. exactly. But uh, uh, also with the NFL abandoning San Diego, the county of about 4 million people plus are hungry for football. The flight to San Diego is only about 15 minutes more than Salt Lake City when you add the time to get to Provo. It would be less time than when you arrive at your hotel in San Diego overall. Aztecs are better fit in the Big 12 than any other school, but they are blind to that fact. So, you know. 
Uh, Eric Myron's his name now, Myron, so I'm yes. sure everybody will remember that. I'll have to look that up again next time he gets brought up. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I've seen San Diego State mentioned before, and we definitely, during the season, when there was a lot of fervor over expansion, took uh, a few San Diego State suggestions. Um, I mean, I think you outline a really good uh, – you know, resume for them. And I certainly would love to, you know, plan on a San Diego road trip every couple of years. That would be fantastic. That's like the, the number one city on my list of places I do want to go. Cause it's, it just seems right it. up my alley. It's I, I don't think I could live in California except if I was in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could see, I could see that. I mean, if it's anything like most of Southern California that I've been to, but better then yeah, I think I'd fall in love pretty quickly. So yeah, I'd love that. Um, I don't, I don't know what the the hold up or the hang up is. I don't know if it's a you know they're just you know behind too many others, uh, or if just right now expansions kind of settled in and you know we had all the big dust up and all that over the summer and then everybody kind of calmed down a little bit. Um, but I, I don't think that uh, they're necessarily out of ever joining you know the Big Twelve or the, uh, another conference. But I just think they're behind other teams, and and I see the appeal, like you said. But I, I don't know what the missing piece is there. I don't know, don't know why it is uh, other than just location or the politics in play in California or or what it is. I, I don't know why they're not considered bigger contenders exactly, but I'm sure somebody could point us in the right direction. But, yeah, I mean, I would be tempted by – again, the thing, though, with expansion is it all sounds great, all sounds fun, but you've got to make the conference money. And so can San Diego State make them money? If they can, then I'm sure somebody will be interested. But if you have to – enter them into the mix and, you know, everybody's making $2 million less on their TV contracts because now there's another team eating a piece of the pie. Well, they're not going to fly and, and go for that. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is exactly. Well, I, I would think they, they do track, though, a little bit with the, you know, look, Orlando is a big metropolitan market. Houston's a massive metropolitan market. Cincinnati's a big metropolitan market. Now, Provo doesn't fall in that category, but BYU has a fan base that far exceeds – the city they're in, mm-hmm. you know, because it's a whole religion. Yeah, it's a whole. Yeah, exactly. They're much like Notre Dame. Yeah, uh, you know. So uh, San Diego, being you know a city, you know four million people, tracks to add a big market, add add that in. So you know, which is why Memphis kind of makes sense, and San Diego is obviously a lot bigger than Memphis. Uh, you know, so that's why that kind of makes sense to me based on what they've done outside of you know with the the other ones. So I mean, it makes sense. I'd be all for it. I, I mean, I'm. I love San Diego. I haven't been since Baylor was in the Holiday Bowl. Uh, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, gas lamp is great. Uh, I have no complaints about San Diego other than high real estate prices and you know nobody's paying me to live there, so I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's a travel situation. I know you're already going out to Utah, but I mean now you add even further travel. Like I mean, how often would West Virginia play San Diego State? And <laughs> I mean that would be a nightmare. Uh, if you had to do that regularly for those two teams. So, I don't know. I mean, it makes sense to couple up Bo- uh, BYU with some teams out there. That's why you see Boise State mentioned quite a bit. But I don't know enough. Uh, yeah. I'll just, I won't pretend to be radio guy who pretends to know everything about everything. I do not know enough about why San Diego State's not considered more, whether that be attendance figures or whether that be TV ratings or – yeah. Funding or what, so. I don't know. But, yeah, location-wise, it sounds great. Yeah. Uh, from Tony, uh, they don't attract a lot of fans in the TV market already. USC, UCLA TV market. Uh, new stadium is tiny but beautiful. Uh, similar issues for why the Chargers moved TV market-wise, you know, so. And I know there are some diehard San Diego State fans, like the uh, the texture there. And there's a couple people on Twitter who I, I feel like I see pretty regularly whenever yeah. there's certain topics brought up. But I, I do wonder, yeah, I, I did wonder initially about attendance and kind of, like, it's just different in Southern California, as we've established, you know, even Los Angeles. Uh, it's a pro, pro sports town, so... Um, I, I don't live in San, never been to San Diego. It's number one on my list, but, uh, yeah, I can see where that would play into things. Yeah. All right. We'll take a break right here. We come back Aim for the Celtics in the fourth quarter. Uh, but the big 12, um, had their best year ever, $426 million, uh, in revenue, um, and that's a 25% over, increase over the past year and 10% higher than its peak, uh, before the pandemic. So, uh, Things are good, and they expect to name a commissioner by mid-July. So some some good news coming out of the Big 12. 
Uh, yeah, there was a lot more than that. I mean, they uh, they got into quite a few things. And uh, as you mentioned, yeah, distribution's higher. Uh, it's a little bit of a bounce back, and that's great. Uh, not, you know, monumental by any means, but uh, certainly they're, you know, above ground, not losing money like uh, those figures that we saw a week or two ago uh, that were the pandemic kind of figures that were out there. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, things are getting back to – uh, normal and even above normal uh, in the case of the Big 12 and their payout. So uh, that's good. I mean, uh, that's, you know, 40 plus million. I know it doesn't really scratch the surface of what, you know, a couple of other conferences are doing, but that's respectable enough and uh, it is an increase. So not going to, not going to pick that apart uh, too much. And yeah, they also mentioned that uh, they will announce a commissioner around Big 12 media days in July. So we're about a month out from that or about a month and a half out from that at this point. And uh, here in about five, six weeks uh, we'll be in Arlington for Big 12 Media Days and uh, I guess at that time that's when we'll we'll all see who the uh, brand new commissioner is and I'm sure there will be a press conference uh, of some sort so we'll get a chance to talk to uh, he or she uh, whoever it ends up being right now I don't know that that anybody really has the inside track on that I've not really spent a lot of time digging into rumors or anything revolving around the Big 12 presidency uh, but um you know, it'll be good to see somebody finally in that chair and uh, who's going to be replacing Bob Bowlesby. I think a lot of people are interested in, in knowing that. Yeah, I wonder I, I, I wonder if it's a name that we'll be familiar with or will be one of those things expected or will be one that comes out of nowhere. I mean, I would think that nobody really expected George Klyovkov to be the Pac-12 commissioner when that happened because, you know, he came from a different world. You know, what are they, what are they really looking for? But we'll know in a month. So, um, you know, there's a lot of obvious names like Oliver Luck out there that people think about. But, you know, I, I don't know if that's really where we need to be thinking. Maybe they have like Mac Rhodes, who will be on the show today at 420. Uh, maybe they have his hiring practices where it's all a secret until, you know, until the announcement. I don't know. Uh, yeah, me neither. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a part of it, so I, I don't have any idea either. But it's been pretty secretive so far. So, yeah, we'll find out here in five weeks uh, in Arlington where, uh, you know, that announcement will be made. But... Um, you just named some of the names that were brought up initially. And like I just said, um, you know, I haven't scouted out a whole lot of the rumor mill surrounding it. So I don't know if anybody else has been mentioned, but um, I think they'll probably try to keep it pretty close to the vest because why announce you're going to make an announcement in five weeks and then spoil the announcement before then. Yeah. Uh, Big 12 also got into some new uh, branding things, which is going to be interesting down the line. I don't know what that, I mean, you know, what that all entails as far as, you know, what you're, you're going to see from them moving forward is to try to rebrand without Texas and Oklahoma and, and make people kind of forget about that because they're not. So you're kind of a new league, and, you know, I know you're going to keep that name, but I don't, I don't know how you – how do you move forward and make people not think losing Texas and Oklahoma is a big deal? I mean, that, that's going to be their key in branding because I don't know how you do that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, that's for those guys making big money to decide that there are – doing this. Uh, so yeah, I have no idea of how you go about trying to rebrand. I mean, I don't think, I don't necessarily think of Oklahoma and Texas when I think of the Big 12. I think of the Big 12. Uh, I think of Baylor and TCU and Tech and Oklahoma and Texas and the Big 12. Uh, so uh, I don't think they're taking their the identity of the conference with them. Some people may feel that way. I don't think it really matters uh, in the long run uh, because it doesn't matter. But uh, yeah, they're they're not going to take the name with them. Uh, it's going to be the Big Twelve. It's going to remain the Big Twelve. It's going to be actually to be twelve teams soon enough. Um, whereas it's only been ten now for a while. And um, you know, I don't know. Do they come up with a new logo? They just did that like three years ago. Uh, do they change the name? That would be kind of pointless because again, you're going to be at twelve teams, and you're not going to just give the identity to Oklahoma and Texas. So. Um, yeah, they could certainly stand to to rebrand or, or what have you um, and change things up a little bit. But as far as how they do that, I didn't see much of that out of the you know the notes that I saw. Um, so if there's anything you can add to that in terms of what actually they're rebranding, um, then pass. Yeah, then I'd be interested. But yeah, I, I don't know what kind of they're they're looking at as far as that goes. But yeah, I think we could certainly agree they they could you know use a little bit of a shuffling of uh, how people view the Big Twelve and the. You know, if they can somehow give it a more positive image because it hasn't been as positive an image as lately, that would be, you know, obviously what, what you're paying people for. So hopefully there's some good ideas out there. Well, Bob Bowlesby seemed happy about it. 
you know, but I mean, that's his job to sometimes, I mean, I don't think he's, he's necessarily a sunshine pumper though, when he doesn't need to be, and he's on the way out. So he, you know, but he said he thinks the league is trending well based on what they, they saw. So, I mean, that's his opinion and that's what he's supposed to say. You know, you wouldn't be like, I don't know what I, you wouldn't want him to say, how does it look? Ah, I wouldn't want that from Bob Bowles on his way out the door, but I mean, he's the one who helped put this thing back together. So. You know, but we don't know what they saw, like, as far as that presentation. We can ask Like, like as far as what? Are we talking about, like, like branding like, presentation? Branding and, like, what the storylines are. And because it's one of the things he said they were working through. Because it's weird with Texas and Oklahoma there on the way out. And they're branding, they're branding a league for the future to build to a new TV deal uh, without these, these two titans of their conference. So he says it's trending. He thinks it's trending well. Well, yeah, I, I would hope so. I yeah. mean, I think if he came out today and said, man, this really sucks, uh, mm -hmm. then we'd all be quite alarmed by that. Um, so, yeah, I think that it, it should be positive. I mean, it's the dead middle of the, the summertime, and they're all meeting, and there's no, you know, there's no uh, reason at this point for things to be going sideways. I mean, you're all just trying to do the best for each other. Oklahoma and Texas are doing the best they can to be civil on their way out. Everybody else that's coming in is – you know, being as uh, civil as they can be with the, those schools that are exiting. And I think everybody's just trying to get along and, and figure out the best things for the Big 12 moving forward. Um, we've, we've talked about, yeah, there's obviously awkwardness there because there's schools that are leaving and schools that are coming in. And uh, I know that, you know, Jamie Pollard touched on that, and I'm sure Mac Rhodes will touch on that as well. But, yeah, as far as the, the branding thing you mentioned, I don't, I don't know really, again, what they're doing there. Uh, but I, I'm glad that, yeah, things are on the up and up. I mean, you would expect it to be that way. There's a bunch of adults. They shouldn't be in a room. Well, we're leaving and we're coming in and you're a duty head. Or I mean, like, I mean, what, what, what angst should there be? There, there, you know, BYU doesn't have beef with Texas and Oklahoma. Hell, it opened the door for them to be in a better place than they've ever been. Same for Cincy and, and Houston and UCF as well. So, I mean, it's a business. Um, you know, all the time for – the, the petty stuff was last summer when the announcement was first made and all throughout this last year. So at this point, everybody needs to just get work done, get to, get to those meetings going and uh, get those handshakes going and get those conversations going on a lot of important issues that are facing college athletics right now because, you know, quite frankly, the branding part of it is the least of their concerns, quite frankly. They need to figure out exits, entrances. They need to figure out schedules. They need to figure out pods. They need to figure out revenue. They need to figure out a TV deal in the future. So, um, you, you know, that's that's all out there for them to, to take care of. And uh, hopefully they're, you know, chipping away at that here or have been chipping away at that here while these meetings have gone on. Yeah, um, in uh, 2020. I uh, wanted to, the question I do have, you know, the, with the revenue, 42.6 million, Obviously, Craig, you know, that's the floor that they'd like to have. But do they get that, you know, going forward with that Texas and Oklahoma? Probably not. Like, you know, can you maintain at $40 million in the next TV deal? I'm curious to see if, if that goes down or if, uh, or, I mean, if that goes way down or if they can, they can maintain in the $40 millions. I don't know. I mean, you know, we're not privy to those conversations. We'll never know. But uh, – I would think that forty million has got to be at least the le the lowest number that they'll accept, or you know, one of the lower numbers they'll accept going forward because you want to stay somewhat competitive, don't you? I mean, I think everybody wants the most money they can have, right? Yeah. Um, and I don't know what they would have as an option, Paul, if they said oh, we're going lower than that. I mean, you just said that's the lowest they'll accept. I mean, then what's their alternative? Or that they would like to accept. Well, that, that they, they would like yeah. to accept. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say if they don't have a choice on what they might have to yeah. accept. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we have no idea right now what the revenue is going to look like in terms of uh, those new schools and what they add. Um, no idea. I mean, we can speculate on it all we want to, but there's not even – they're not even the, the deal that's next up. I mean, you know, we see the Big Ten, we see the SEC, we talk about the billion-plus dollars or whatever. I mean, they're certainly not going to even scratch that surface. Um, and, I mean, to, to think otherwise would be totally unrealistic and living on another planet. So I don't think there's many people out there, if any people out there, that think they'll, you know, get anywhere in that vicinity. Um, but, you know, how low does it go or how high does it go? I mean, again, no idea. They, they still have three years left before that's negotiated, I believe, or, or at least two before that comes up. So in the meantime, these networks are looking at the Pac-12. They're looking at, you know, the others that come up before – uh, and other potential deals. So, um, I mean, we didn't have Netflix uh, basically, you know, dropping off the face of the earth uh, six months ago. Uh, but you see, you know, their revenue now, and you see the the way that the 
things are kind of shifting over there. Uh, it's not this. It's not quite the juggernaut that it appeared to be a couple years ago. So for everybody predicting like Netflix will carry college football or, or whatever hopes there were, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen six months from now. So I have no idea when the Big 12 is negotiating in three years or two years uh, what they're going to be potentially facing and what they're going to be comparing it to. But you know, 40 plus is healthy enough to run these athletic departments and if uh you know they need much more than that well then somebody better go out and win a football national championship or something i mean i, I don't know what else you can really do other than go out and just win games to to really raise your profile all that much and it's hard when you don't have necessarily schools that don't even have to win games to raise their profile that's what the sec's filled with even though they do have those same teams that do win lots of games but you know texas and oklahoma oklahoma steadily won texas not so much has it really dinged their brand at all has it cost them any revenue even though they've been you know right they're having a great athletic year right now outside of you know the 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 main sports even though in in basketball both basketballs they did well as well so kudos to the longhorns on their their athletic year but them being average in football hasn't affected their dollar amount so um you know they don't have any brands that can just carry that they just simply on name alone they just carry a tv broadcast so it'll be interesting to see you know how they're viewed um you know with Baylor and Oklahoma State and BYU and Cincinnati. I mean, there's there's some names there, but what kind of dollar figure does it bring? Uh, I have no idea. But, yeah, you'd have to hope that you at least maintain what you're making right now. I mean, just simply inflation, you would hope you're making more money. Um, but, yeah, no, no clue on what that actually looks like, and I don't think they really have a clue what that looks like because it's – it's not right in front of them at the moment. No, not at all. Uh, in the 